now call to order this April 1st meeting of the Waterbury Select Board, noting that uh, we've got uh, one Select Board member uh, who is absent due to a death in the family. Um, first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? I will propose to remove the minutes of March 18th from the consent agenda and have them be the first item before public, and also to add um, a buyout request for 34 Union Street before next meeting agenda at 935. Buyout and elevation. Buyout and elevation of 34 Union. Okay. Any further discussion on the proposed amendment? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, now uh, we're voting on the amended agenda. All in favor say aye. Oh, wait a minute. Just for the discussion. Was there a second? Okay. Oh, so she seconded and then amended. Mm -hmm. We seconded, but someone has a second. I will second that. Thanks, so. I say just, that. just to be correct. Okay. Now that it's been seconded, we'll vote again. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now we are voting on the uh, amended agenda. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The agenda is approved as amended. Next on the agenda is the uh, amended consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented in the agenda. Okay. Second. All right. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The consent agenda is approved as amended. Next on the agenda are the minutes from last meeting. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the minutes of March 18th, 2024 with additional clarification regarding Valerie Rogers' desire for the Vermont State Police reports, which was just in public comment and it's adding four words as requested. Okay. So I have a second. Second. All right. All, any further discussion? All in favor of approving the minutes as amended, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the minutes are approved as amended. Next is the session uh, where the public uh, is invited to address anything not on the warrant agenda. Um, I had two people signal their interest in coming forward. Uh, First, Mel, uh, are you interested? No. Okay. Eric, would you like to come forward? Sure. Come right up. Well, we're in this deep, this uh, owner of the movie at Alfredo's Archie Stowe, and uh, we're here because so. Have a seat, Eric. <laughs> I can sit down. Can you stand? Yes, the other person. I hope for that. Where are we? Because we're putting the petition together. And we, for the um, protection of the reservoir from white folks. And what's happening, and we, we actually had a big win on the 14th of February. And that was, uh, we got the north arm and the east arm protected from white support use. For that. And so now the dam arm has about a mile long, so like the, the middle of it, like I showed you some yeah. of up there. And it's 500 feet from shore. And there's quite a situation cropping up there because uh, anyone who has experienced these boats knows that even a fishing boat, a motorized fishing boat, can easily get ripped over with these things. And so and every every boat, every out of order, every motor boat, everybody coming off the dam, launching a dam site, is going to be uh, tackling those boats, and uh, and they would be off with us. I mean, nobody in the right mind would run through the um, campsite. It's over in that area. 
-hmm. And also, it's going to make a lot of noise for the campus and the state campgrounds. And they're, they're dealing with that. So the, we have a request for full vaccine. Um, I think we've got a few copies here. We can kind of pass them around, but they. And I will, if it's okay, just if you stay at the table, the owl has ordered yeah, who's recording the, the meeting, and I just want to make sure oh, anyone online oh, okay, can hear great. your comments. So this is uh, that last statement right there is the, what we're asking for. It's a simple sentence. It's simply saying uh, the Waterbury Select Board supports the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir petition to prevent the water or weak sports on the Waterbury Reservoir. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Even this is not the strictest rule. Uh, the stricter rule would have been a thousand feet from shore, and even that rule, uh, weight sports people would have ninety six percent of the surface waters uh, that they could use. So, uh, in any kind of a, a contested situation, ninety six percent would be a pretty nice win. So it's not a, <clears throat> that we're going to be going to uh, a number of other. Uh, organizations to get their support and i'm hoping that there is that one sentence that's all we're asking for and so i'll be i think i just showed you the the, the first uh well we're getting close to getting this thing done Good. but in that petition i have to tell you uh i have literally hundreds of hours in that the time sitting down and researching it has to be exactly right there's no fluff involved here. The people at A and R and B C are very aware of the whole situation that's, that's unfolding. This is the first year, by the way, that the industry itself is making a major push to occupy these lakes in New England. And the reason is that they've saturated other parts. And the thing that I sent you today, if uh, by email, if you go online and look at that. You'll see that the, the, the one of the places in Georgia, uh, there's, there's just some pretty interesting stuff there. Georgia. Every whenever they come in, even one of these boats, just one on a Waterbury Reservoir, dominates. You just don't dare go out there when they're there. You're going to get flipped over or whatever. You know, if you had a big enough boat, you wouldn't be probably much. Small fishing boats, motorized fishing boats, paddle boats, canoeists. Whatever. So, you know, I won't take up much of your time. I, I know you appreciate very much a couple of minutes here to, sure. to kind of explain that, but uh, I'd be glad to come back as we get this thing finalized. And I, did I get that cut back from you, Tom? The, uh, did you get the uh, uh, right there? there. So, yeah. <laughs> and so you're going to get the, you're going to continue circulating the petition, is that right? Yes, we're going to sit, and by the way, this isn't a petition for signatures. It's a petition from uh, support from people like the Conservation Commission, yourselves. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of a petition. Oh, I see. So, it's a, uh, see right here, that's the sentence right there that we're kind of looking for, something like that. And, um, and I could leave this with you if anybody's looking. We have 11 signatories. You probably know most of the people who wrote these letters in town. I got my first, my, my first letter from a fisherman. And uh, we have two fishermen uh, that work with us at the, you know, not the still at the fishing uh, place there. And, uh, but I never gotten anything from the phone call. <laughs> but so, and Gordon Lang, I don't know if you know him or not, but yeah. uh, Gordon's a, really, he moved to Flush Hill to be close to the lakes, his fishing, before his fishing. He hasn't been out on the lake for three years because of the wake boats. So anyway, I'll leave, I'll leave this copy here. There's some really nice writings in there. Tell me what you want, look at them. And um, now we'll let you get on here. Eric, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming in, taking the time, putting a lot of work into this. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just add one thing is yeah. that the Come on, board forward. is aware yeah. is that um could you just state your name for the rest yeah uh Stephen Brownlee, uh Friends of Water Bear Reservoir, also um with Eniac Outfitter, so got some a little bit of uh, history of the Water Bear Reservoir. Uh one of the aspects that uh we really want to make sure that you folks know uh as a select board of Waterbury is uh this um 
uh, we vote policy that's happening all around the state. Most um, towns have, uh, wherever there's a pond, there's a lake association. Mm -hmm. Water barrier reservoir is unique in that standpoint that there is no lake association. So the voice of the community is really the, the select board and our little organization, the Friends of Water Barrier Reservoir. And so we're just trying to amplify that uh, a little bit and get your folks uh, involved in you know what's happening on this lake because it we feel like it's really going to impact the future uh water very red right. and just if I could add just a little thing about the the revenue that comes in from this I just went today and I said you know these things I just gave you but the um, forest and parks the, the state has um, estimated that close to 500 million dollars comes in from the lakes and ponds in the state um, the Waterbury Reservoir had a meeting about 10 years ago, said there was about $8 million of money coming into this area right here. And it's probably more like uh, 15,000 now. And you, and you, and you can do it. And so it's, uh, it's like a gift. I mean, if somebody would have had a town like this and didn't have a lake, they would beg for stuff like this. This is our, our version of Mount Mansfield, if you will. And, uh, but it's, it's uh, probably 15 million coming into the area. It's a, it's a revenue producer that we don't even have to think about. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you for thank you. All right. great. Okay. Thank you. We'll uh, look at uh, the agenda for next week uh, at the end of the meetings and uh, see when we come and take this back out. Any, any other comments from the public? Anything that's not on the one agenda? Thanks again, John. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, Mike. One. Just an acknowledgement right now, as we speak, the University of Vermont women's basketball team is playing in the women's NIP. They're in the, in the men, they would call it the Elite Eight, but I guess in the women, they call it the Great Eight in the NIP. So good luck to UVM. If, if, if they win tonight, they'll go on to the WNIP Final Four. <laughs> an amazing comp, uh, thing for, <laughs> yes. Good luck, UVM. All right. Any other comments? All right. Let's move forward with uh, board recommendations. Uh, we have three seats available on the Harwood uh, Unified School Board and four candidates. And so we'd like to ask the candidates to come forward. And I think we'll go in uh, alphabetical order by last name. And the first one is Elizabeth Brown. You're going to just jump on the hot seat at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, welcome and thank you for uh, stepping forward. Um, I think we'd just like to hear uh, why you're interested in the position and why you think you're qualified to serve. Do you have a, and I have maybe three or four minutes? Uh, you have 10. I have 10. All right, I prepared some remarks. Uh, here we go. All right, our education funding system is broken. No one is debating that consensus on the key problems and the drivers is in question. But underlying it all is too much complexity, lack of transparency, and band-aids that are only exacerbating the issue. Vermont has a history of being very proud of its public education, but we must not correlate the second highest spending in the country with the best outcomes. In fact, over the past decade, some research shows our results are going in the wrong direction. Additionally, we cannot conclude that per student spending correlates with equity and equal outcomes, but that is fundamentally where we are. The problem that Harwood faces is not just getting through this year's budget. There's a four year cliff, and taxpayers need to be prepared for large increases, not just this year, but through 2029. They also need to understand that with these increases, the Harwood budget is modestly increasing. The new proposed budget is only about seven to eight percent, and our programs will be cut. In other words, as a comparatively wealthy area where our student population has sustained versus a profit state of down ten percent, we are shipping our dollars elsewhere. That needs to be abundantly clear to our taxpayers. We can cut programs fundamental to our kids and to our communities. We can consolidate schools because. 
without conclusive data showing this, that seems to be the other catch-all for solving these problems. We can watch our buildings crumble. Or we can do things differently and be a force for facilitating and crafting the change required. What I find frightening is listening to the hours of State Education Committee testimony and that the majority are looking to our state for direction. Many legislatures who are new to their role may or may not understand the history of how we've gotten here and certainly don't understand the funding formula. But yet, we are sitting on a wealth of skills, talent, experience, knowledge in our community that are not being tapped effectively to solve the problems we face today. The solution obviously does not just sit within the Harwood District, nor should the rain sit squarely with the state. We need a balance of guidance from the state with more partnership and more input from districts and regions. With 30% of the budgets failing, representing 40% of students, now is a time to secure that regions take back more control and more say of how the money is being used and ensure that it's being used effectively with clear measures that our community can hold us accountable to. We need partnerships with the state, not just big data. There's been excellent analysis already done on what needs to be accomplished to bring our costs down while improving outcomes. I'm referring to the Pincus Odin engagement that was completed in 2016. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. We are not the only state who has to consider poverty in rural areas, but we do have to think differently and be able to challenge the status quo. Affordability in Vermont, many believe, I believe, is the most important issue on the table right now. Almost daily I'm engaged in conversation or overhearing people in our community saying they just can't do it anymore. They're packing up. And the Harvard School Board has an important role in making it affordable for our taxpayers to remain here. Equally, we must deliver for our kids and empower our teachers and provide a sustainable living for them. Doable? I think so. I believe that my two decades class of experience in financial management, banking, strategic planning, and strategic development, development make me well suited to represent our community as we're facing unprecedented challenges. We can't do it all, but with precision, focus, communication, clarity of goals, hard choices, we can balance the needs of all our stakeholders, taxpayers, students, teachers, and administrators. In conclusion, in the near term, my focus will be working with the state and across districts to make sure our voice is heard in educational reform. Deep dive into Harvard financials to find efficiencies. And lastly, making sure we're providing better communication to our taxpayers so they fully understand what we can control, what we can't, and that's up for debate, and how we're making the most of what we do have to protect and to deliver for our students and our teachers. <laughs> Questions? Uh, but I thank you for your very um, germane comments. I think it, what you said was very important. Uh, but would you be supportive? I know the existing school board, I've been to several school board meetings, and they've taken off the table potential staff cuts. And you know, I said, well, you may have to consider them because, you know, we're at the point where we just can't afford, you know, taxpayers can't, you know, they're at the point where they just can't afford it anymore. And, you know, I fear blank stares from especially the superintendent's office, like you can't, we can't cut anymore. As a matter of fact, they had one, right. one alternative that they weren't, weren't even going to consider. So would you consider cuts of staff if, if you could reorganize some positions to, um, you know, better sustain education at all. I haven't been under the hood. I haven't seen the line items, but my gut reaction to that is absolutely you have to, unfortunately, right? And these are people right. who live in our communities. We're talking cutting jobs. When you look across the whole entire state, you're probably talking about 500 jobs that are you know, as these budgets, these 30% that fail, we're talking dramatic, dramatic cuts. And these are our friends, these are people in the community. Yeah. It's heartbreaking, but you have to do that because there's only so much taxpayers can do. And when you're still looking at a 20 to 25% increase in property taxes and more the three years after that, I don't know that everybody knows that. It's not doable. And so with the current system, the way the state is dictating it, that is what is going to happen. So I would hate to do that. And that's why I believe we need to fundamentally be working with the state and say that system is broken. But I think you do have to look at cuts. Thank you. 
Okay. You mentioned the background in banking and finance. Mm -hmm. And so my first thought was, well, when a bank is thinking that a business is failing, the first thought is to liquidate. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, we've already spoken about staff cuts, and we've mentioned that you haven't been under the hood. When it comes to public education, there's not much in the way of liquidation. Not a whole lot left to tear off out of the builders. Okay. Um, so when you cut staff and you increase capital classroom sizes, what else is there left to do? What do you strip? You strip sports out, you strip sciences, arts. There's not a whole lot left to strip out. How do you how would you solve a, a what seems to be an endless cycle of we, we can't cut it, but we can't afford it either. So I would say a couple of things. I think the first thing they would do is actually not the day. You try to right size a ship, right? And so you have to get under the hood and see what you can do. And I believe that you can, I think across the board, and again, I'm coming back to the testimony I've been listening to on YouTube at the state level, I think we just keep coming back to the same old solutions, right? And I know that our population within the Harwood district is flat. It hasn't gone down. And then there's still equalized people, you know, this year. But we do have at the administration, we've got other types of support. So it's not just student ratios. And although in our student ratios is quite good, but I do know that our schools are at capacity. Again, I don't have all the numbers in front of me. And so and I'm also a big proponent. I have two children, by the way, who are in the schools, grade five and nine, you know, and I've got an athlete at Harwood. And I keep hearing all the testimony that they're having to provide all these mental health services and other types of services right now. And I'm a strong believer that these extracurricular activities and having kids be strong in their bodies and be healthy is just as important as that mental health. So I'm not somebody who's just going to say, okay, we're going to cut all the extracurriculars. But I think that there are efficiencies. There's always efficiencies. I've had to deal with budgets in my 22 years of, of, of working where you've had to make some hard choices. There's always line items. There's always money to be found. And we're going to have to do that. Any other questions? No? Might have been answered. Elizabeth, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next candidate is Dan Waltney. Hi there. Thank you too for stepping forward. If you wouldn't mind also addressing why you're why you're uh, putting your name in candidacy and why you keep the up. Yeah, so I've been in uh, education, public education in some form for about 20 years. Um, I've been a classroom teacher in multiple states. I've been a district administrator. I've worked at state departments of education on various projects. Um, and when I moved to Vermont here in Waterbury a little over a year and a half ago, I was hearing a lot of the churn and the bubble and up of some of the concerns that were just spoken around. And I think um, my classroom experience, my just overall education experience coupled with um, my business experience. I'm currently a vice president at a uh, educational um, technology company. Um, you know that really focuses on, um, or that gives me the purview or the lens to really look at a lot of these challenges um, and how do we maintain supportive, healthy schools with vibrant communities uh, while also may, remaining sustainable. Right? We cannot fund our way out of many of these problems. Uh, so I think, you know, the opportunity to, to really roll the sleeves up with that experience, help look for some of the, the hidden dollars that oftentimes we find in school systems, whether that's, um, you know, consolidation or whether that's staff reductions or whether that's looking at individual program lines at school sites or, you know, whatever curriculum or technology solutions are in place and what are those overall costs. I've walked into school districts across the country that continually cry poor and then have um, shrink wrap textbooks in their closets up the hall that haven't been touched in eight years, right? So, you know, again, kind of borrowing the phrase of having to look under the hood, there's always something like that 
right? And so to the extent where we can maintain our healthy environments, where we can maintain our high performing um, or our, our, our high standards uh, for learning and outcomes um, while making sure that we don't price our communities out of the community through tax increases, I think it's important. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves to help find those uh, options. Questions? Like, same question that I asked Ms. Brown, how do you consider if um, staff cuts, you know, I know none of us like to hear staff, cuts, but you know, if, if they're necessary, can you, how do you look at some heavier staff cuts in the supervisory district has been going to? I think kind of going back to something I said a few minutes ago, is we have to look at where those staff are allocated and what service functions are they allocated? Are they curricular? Are they directly informing instruction in the classroom? Are they superlative, you know, supporting things, um, you know, outside of, say, core academics, maybe more yes, resource officers, social workers, or something to those effects? Like, to what extent can we look at the individual programs measure the efficiency and efficacy of those programs, what kind of personnel are associated with them. My point is basically we have to look programmatically across each piece and as part of that, not just evaluate the spend on consumables or technology, but also look at the spend on the personnel and where are other gaps existing where we may have open headcounts that we're trying to recruit, where we can retrain and repurpose some of those people cut the program if it's only being, if it's underutilized or it's not being utilized at all, but we're still funding it for some reason. Mm -hmm. To what extent can we look at those types of savings and the people that are associated with it and possibly repurpose it so we can maintain or we can maintain staff levels potentially, we have to look at the detail by lowering some of the program costs, repurposing those staff elsewhere. If all that work has been done and, and we don't have you know, programs that are either underutilized, not utilized, or not delivering the effectiveness. And so we have to use the data that all of our systems are uh, consolidated to determine whether or not those programs are effective. If we've answered all of those questions and the answer is, is staff and we can't sell property and we can't, you know, raise funds, you know, through volunteers or other forms, then that does unfortunately leave personnel that has to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for your disposition. Um, I come from a family of teachers. Um, and recently, the complaints have been about load size mm -hmm. in the classroom, whether it's students or caseloads. My mother and sister are both special educators. And the size of caseloads are growing every year. Um, and so when we do come to cost cutting, and looking at the amount of folks that are on staff, if we end up having to cut them loose and those case sites, those caseloads grow, mm -hmm. and we, we just end up losing those educators to other districts. Is that something that you would consider walking in to the school board? Every day I deal with the school district across the country that's struggling with um, staffing. I mean, it, it, it's ubiquitous across the country, right? You know, irrespective of the amount of dollars that we could potentially throw, uh, there still has to be a, a pipeline of people that actually want to do the work, right? And so what I want to make sure is that we don't necessarily, that we look at the problem of class size, and we don't just look at it as throwing bodies at it, but what other resources do we have that can offload that? Are there process improvements that we can play? Are there additional, you know, are there underutilized technologies or tools that we can help with some of the workflows that make, make the day-to-day -day easier? Because I remember juggling, getting there in the morning, doing my morning duty, teaching a full day of classes, also covering three days a week at lunch, and then I coached after school, right? You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of capacity, but I also know that there were tools and resources that weren't necessarily available to all the teachers or they weren't necessarily aware. Um, you know, I think there, there's ways that we can approach the class size issue through improved workflows, improved efficiencies that, leave it as it is, but I don't think 
you know, we have we don't know that throwing additional bodies actually reduces our class size if we're going to continue to have the churn that we have. So, irrespective of that, we still have to be looking for these other areas to draw a conversion from. Yeah. Um, can you speak to experience on a volunteer board and your perspective on the relationship between board members and administration and staff? Yeah, so I have served in volunteer capacities, um, not in Vermont, um, but where I previously came from in North Carolina. Um, that's been through animal rescue. That was a big uh, thing that I have been a part of for a number of years. Um, and um, as well as some educational work, um, PTAs, et cetera, those types of things. In terms of relationships, et cetera, um, I'm a big believer in um, collaboration, right? I mean, you know, uh, any board that you work on, people need to know kind of what your positions are on certain things and identify the areas where we can address and try to compromise. Um, and so that, that happens through open, transparent conversation, that happens through um, professionalism, that happens through a shared agreement on the outcomes that we're moving towards. Um, we may choose to approach them differently, but we can't disagree on what those outcomes are. And in this case, we're, we're looking to have a strong, sustainable system. Uh, you mentioned that you're interested in workforce development. Uh, how would your position on the school board help to propel that? So I think one of the things that we struggle with is, you know, um, is clearly articulating for our students that there's alternatives from just graduating high school and picking up a job graduating high school and going to college. There's a continuum between those things. Um, and I don't feel that we have done a great job in, as broad education in ensuring that our students are aware that that is a continuum. That 20, 25 years ago, the push always was, we'll go to college, right? And everybody go to college. And then what do you end up having? You have still 30% of the population with college degrees. You have increasing dropout rates because we don't articulate paths and we don't have great community business relationships that extend beyond like a chamber of commerce agreement or something like that. So when we look at things like, you know, the semiconductor work that's coming to Vermont as part of some of the recent legislation, well, what are the educational needs of those uh, future employers, whether it's, you know, a, a leading edge employer or an established employer, what are those connections to what the students need to deliver, and how do we create more of a pipeline outside of just sending kids to a college or putting them immediately into the workforce or sending them to the military? What are the apprentice programs? What are the, the, the mentorship programs? And, and how can we use the tools, the systems, the volunteers, the businesses, the chambers of commerce, et cetera, to ultimately help influence and inform more of what those students are going to need from a true workforce position into the classroom to make it more of a partnership. Okay. I don't know vocational school, and I appreciate you saying that. Mm -hmm. um, this question is actually for Jim, because you're on the board currently for our board. Um, do you know what do you know what percentage of Harwood students are attend um, Central Vermont Tech? I don't know the exact percentage, but it's quite a high number, actually. Is it? Yeah, it's that way across a lot of central Vermont. That is a very highly utilized uh, type of center. I don't know the exact number. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mike, just as a follow up to one of your comments, um, you said you were from North Carolina, and I don't know how involved you were. It sounds like from your experience, you were involved in education down in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. How do their supervisory districts in terms of size relate to the size of, say, you know, the Harlem district? Um, you know, well, the Vermont districts in, in general, and how efficient are they based upon their size and staffing? So North Carolina um, and Arizona, which is where I also taught, um, operates on largely county-based boards or um, city boards. Okay. Um, however, um, counties in those states range anywhere from 220,000 students all the way down to 
800, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the, the district that I lived in the longest um, in North Carolina was a school district that supported around 3,700 students. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, it also is a, um, it's no different, I would say, than, than what I've seen here in Vermont. The state education authority proposes policy and, and things that then the local boards have to, to implement through their policies, et cetera. Uh, so I don't generally see it different beyond the, what I perceive as the reverse um, phenomenon that I see here where that the local boards have some greater voice in what may be not necessarily moving the needle, but greater pipeline should be back in the city. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Corey Hackett. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you and to your family for your stepping forward. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Corey Hackett. I'm a Waterbury resident. <laughs> I, uh, I've been a Waterbury, Waterbury resident for 20 years. <laughs> and reason for looking to be on the school board is when I sat in that um, voting booth and I went to go select a school board member and having nobody there hurt, hurt. And I, my wife had been on the board for four years and I had thought, I thought about the idea of taking her spot and she decided to step down. And I, I kicked myself for not moving forward and get myself on that ballot because it hurt to see that there was no names on that ballot. Um, I've watched this with my wife be on the board for the last four years. I've watched almost every every meeting, so I have some some somewhat of awareness of what's going on with that. Um, I uh, wish I had worded something that I would read. <laughs> um, I think our wider stable. Yeah, <laughs> I think I just read everything on there. Okay. Um, I think my position on the board would be suitable as I've dealt with, or I've been on many different leadership boards in the past, the years of the curator work, and I uh, actually was on his own board uh, many years ago. I think I, I feel like I work well with others. Um, I think everybody needs to have an opinion at the table, um, and differences are good. It gets the discussion going. I don't claim to be the expert. I, some of the, the previous two that uh, spoke sound very, very um, beneficial to their role to do it. Uh, present a lot to the, to the board as well. Yeah. Yeah, like we're blocking. Right. Question. Take some questions. Mike. Just to be fair, I, okay. Uh, I've asked the other two candidates how would you, how would you deal with you know, we're facing some real challenges, you know, on the Ohio, you know, district. How would you look at it, uh, be receptive and how would you look at significant cuts to personnel, you yeah. know, you know, in, in the district to help, you know, mitigate, you know, taxing churches? Sure. I think we really need to understand what those cuts would mean, right? Um, and it's, I understand administration's um, hesitation to call out what cuts might be because then people are going to feel like they got a target, like that's my job. Um, but I think if that's the way we need to go, then we need to, as a, as a whole community, understand what those cuts might mean to, to our students and to our community. Um, I also think the, and I know the administration is doing this on an ongoing effort where they, as they get through nutrition, they review that position and decide if they need to go forward to it. I think having that as a kind of process would help in the long term, right? It helps helps avoid cutting the cutting the heads and even the purpose of understanding what it is how we're how we're evolving. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just gonna do the questions that are the last two. So like Mike, I might need some questions. That's fine. Um so I want to ask you about 
Yeah. I want to ask you about workforce development. I really like the last few days. Um, application. Um, as I said before, mm -hmm. I'm a graduate of a tech school, and it was incredibly beneficial for me. I don't think with that, without it, I would have graduated high school. Yeah, not great student, um, but there are a lot of students now who see college or workforce or join the military. As right. I said before, um, do you have any ideas behind what promoting alternatives <laughs> level would be? Classic style of classroom. Strong advocate for that. My my old son um, is very interested in the trades and trying to get him to um, some programs to help develop that. He's worked with some local trade in the summertime, which is great. Um, he's taking advantage of the CCB program that's coming up in the year and actually you know, attend uh, CCB at a senior high school. Um, he's also participated in some work shadowing. I think as a district, I think there's, I think there are things we are doing that are being done. I think we need to um, help advertise that more, speak up about that. And I think that will help those that might not know what's to offer to the children or the kids out there, um, what opportunities are there and help perpetuate that. Um, but super strong, wonderful, increase our trades. I'm a uh, general contractor at South Hero. I'm mean, going to need more tradesmen for sure. Right on. Yeah. Um, Corey, you mentioned uh, that you uh, work well with others uh, and you've had leadership experience. Um, can you say how uh, what what you see your role being uh, on the board? Uh, we've got six towns participating in this mm -hmm. unified. School board. Uh, Waterbury is the largest one, um, but there are others that are fiercely resisting. Uh, you know, trying to protect their primary schools uh, with the minimal uh, number of students. How, what do you see your role being uh, within the school board itself? I, I see as a conduit to the voice for the for Waterbury, right? Mm -hmm. Being being that avenue for Waterbury just to voice their thoughts and their opinions. Conversely, bring the board, the board, I guess, the board communication back to the community also. Um, I think it's understanding all the parties involved on the other side of the valley. Like what, so you mentioned that they might not be up to some of the things that we've been wanting to do in the past and try to understand more about that and have that discussion with those members about why and how can we what grounds can we come to? Is there a common ground? Is there someone in the middle of the plan? Um, I think maybe in the past too, we've, we've tried these different consolidation plans and stuff, and, but there was really no plan other than the consolidate. It really wasn't spelled out well how that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So if we can come up with a better way, if that's the avenue that we want to take to help with us, we can come up with an actual plan that we can communicate to everybody that we can digest. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we get. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We have one more candidate, Dan Rossicoli. Dan, I may have butchered your last name. Rossioli. Rossioli. Not even else. I've heard my voice. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming forward. You mind also explaining why you're interested in this edition? Why you should be qualified? Very much. Um, I'm going to start maybe by addressing why I think nobody ran for this position in the first place, because I think that's a piece that didn't, hasn't been mentioned yet. But serving on a school board, I think, is a pretty thankless position, and they tend to get beat up a little bit. And I think everybody on some level knows that the next five years of finance is going to be a disaster. Um, and who wants to sign up for that voluntarily, right? So thankfully, I think we have four good candidates here today. Uh, so I'm glad to see that because I was a little bit worried that I'd be the only one signing up for this. <laughs> um, I think on a 40,000 foot level, the previous candidates have already talked a lot about um, what we need to do in the next few years 
we all know the state school financing system is broken. Um, we know we don't have control over that piece. Um, so the role of the board has to become, or has to focus on the controllables that we have. Um, so backing up and just giving my personal story a little bit, I have four kids in the system, um, ages 8, 11, 16, and 18, all of which have taken very different academic approaches so far. And through that, I would maybe argue the opposite of what some people said, that I don't think our outcomes are fantastic right now. Um, and I think that our educational outcomes could be improved considerably. Uh, for example, um, one of my kids effectively dropped out in the ninth grade because he wasn't learning anything. He wasn't getting anything out of school. As soon as he turned 16, he got his GED, did a couple of classes at CCB. He's almost done his Champlain program right now. He's only 16 years old. And he flew through that once he got out of the public school system. So that told me that there's some issues in the public school system that uh, probably go beyond just the finance piece that we're focused on right now. <clears throat> As a small business owner for 20 years, I've kind of made a career out of doing more with less. And I think that's kind of the position that we're going to be in for the next few years. Uh, the first candidate mentioned that this is like a 40 year um, tax increase that we're looking at, where it could be 25% per year if nothing changes, which I mean, 100% tax increase in four years is a tough pill to swallow. Um, so I think my business experience will help us kind of look at bigger picture items that I think maybe get skipped a lot of times when we're having discussions about how to save money. So to me, the board isn't looking at the good trying to find uh, nickels and dimes here and there. It's bigger picture. How do we restructure? How do we restructure grades? How do we restructure the towns? And then holding the administrative team to finding the nickels and dimes that are to be found underneath. <laughs> so, for example, um, in one of the cost comparisons in the bond discussion, the board was comparing the cost of a brand new high school at 180,000 square feet to the cost of renovations. 180 square feet, 180,000 square feet is huge. It's way bigger than what the uh, Department of Education would suggest we need for a student body our size. Why are we looking at 180,000 square foot school at the cost comparison when we need maybe half of that? So there's these bigger questions that I think the board hasn't been even asking for the last few years. And all these things that um, we're missing is preventing us, I think, from really tackling some of these cost problems. So you've asked all candidates about staff, right? In 2022, we had 366 full-time employees. We have 385, I think, right now. No more students, but we have 20 more, 23 more staff members, right? Um, I think those questions need to be asked to the administrative team. Uh, there may be good answers. I don't know. I don't have all the answers necessarily, but I think I can ask the right questions in these board meetings. Um, questions? Oh, you, you, answered you already question. answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate you preaching that, that issue because I think a lot of people don't look at what outcomes are versus sometimes, you know, it's not always a dollars and cents. It's really about outcomes. You know, I know I went to school to install assistant teachers and things. Thank thank I'm not saying assistant teachers are not needed. You know, but they have to really re relook at the, what the education system is. And I don't think you know. You know, it's easy to throw more money at things. And I think you brought up an excellent point. They want to have a big facility, and we're having declining, you know, student 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 participation. Correct. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to look at the last two or three years and say, well, enrollment is steady. We had a nice little bump of people move up here from the right. Project, right? But the 20 year trend and all the forecasts show a considerable yeah. downward trend in enrollment. So, are we going to be having this discussion every year? What's the right staffing number? I think we probably are. All right. Um, so, how do we frame that discussion? <laughs> okay. So, every candidate that we spoke to, including yourself, has talked about running a business, some kind or another. And cost cutting. 
Um, I also manage a heavy section of the business I'm employed by. Um, and when it comes to cost cutting, we usually hit labor first and then we go into you know, products. But I don't have a student body that I need to educate. So when it comes to cost cutting, how do we maintain at least some level of a decent education while we're cutting staff and cutting the extra fat? Okay. Um, let me offer one idea as an example. The discussion in the last few years have been about closing Harvard Middle School and consolidating to Cross the right? Those have all been attached with, well, we need to grow across the brook if we're going to do that. We need to add a wing. We need to spend however many millions of dollars on bond money for that. Well, why? If we make hardwood 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so eighth grade is out of the system, we can consolidate, keep hardwood, I mean, keep process the same size as it is, as it is, and not have to spend on infrastructure. All right? There's a lot of different ways we've talked about. I think um, aligning things in terms of towns, fellowship based in flows, should, you know, this type of stuff. Well, maybe we should look at how do we align the grades. What if all the schools, the primary schools were K to four, pre K to four, instead of having a mix of some going to four, some going to six? What if the high school was eight to 12 instead of nine to 12? How do we shift things like that so that each school is in more of a sweet spot in terms of their capacity? So right now we have a couple of schools that are. 50, 60% of their theoretical capacity. And then we have a couple that are probably a little over 100% theoretical capacity. Well, how do we distribute those students so that we're running a more efficient like 75% capacity across all the schools? Some of those questions I think haven't even been looked at. I'm not sure why. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, you were convinced that the outcomes were as good as they could be. Uh, citing the case with your, your own student. Um, what are some, can you cite one example of how you might improve those incomes outcomes? Okay, uh, the state itself, well, I fault them a lot for the finance mess. I think they, in some ways, they put in some really good programs. For example, as Corey mentioned, his son is doing the uh, CCD for the college program. One of my kids did that. Uh, dual enrollment. One of my kids did that. Uh, one of my younger ones, who wasn't being challenged in math at Brookside, is doing an online math program on his own. Uh, we have this tech, I think, that's available to us, and these systems that we rushed through during the COVID times that had some real positive outcomes for some students. I'm not saying everyone should be learning at home. That's not the answer. But what pieces did we learn from that that we just kind of threw away in the process of getting back to normal? Mm -hmm. um, I only have a sample size of four in my house for kids, right? but they all excelled in the hybrid learning of being in school part-time, being at home part-time. Uh, so maybe there's opportunities to use those kinds of uh, models that have proven successful in a number of places um, rather than just trying to maintain the educational model that we've been doing for the last you know, hundred and some odd years. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, we appreciate it. Um, our job is to select, uh, we had zero candidates uh, a month ago, and uh, now we have four for three spots. Our job is to select three of the candidates who came forward tonight. Uh, to fill uh, the slots available and make those recommendations to uh, the school board. Um, we're going to be doing that during our deliberative session later on tonight. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Um, I actually got a legal opinion about that. Yep. And because you are making a recommendation to the school board and you are not the appointing authority, that has to be done in open session. Uh -huh. All right. It doesn't have to be done today, of course, but it has to be done in another session. All right. Well, now changes what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, do I have a motion? Sure. Are we going to do it one at a time? Um, Might as well. 
Well, you could uh, suggest a slate. Yeah, we'd have to have uh, sir. Are we able to comment before you? Uh, sure. Um, I'd just like to say that What's your relative to the discussion, my name is Steve Martin. I live in Waterbury. Um, I've attended, every, I think, every in person school board meeting that's been had since this whole budget thing came up. And we'd just like to offer my opinion that, first off, I think all the school board members that are currently there are good people with good intentions. It is heavily weighted, in my opinion, to people that are looking, not looking at all at any possibility of staff cuts, um, student ratios, anything like that, and very little as what the actual financial impact is. So my, for my two cents, I would love to see the board recommend some people that can provide some balance. In business life, I was a hard case and I needed people around me that took the emotional person side of the issue. In my opinion, the school board that exists now needs some additions that will help them look at some of the financial side of it and the tax side of it. Regardless of the outcomes, I don't think we can afford doubling the tax in four years like was suggest suggested. And I don't think Montpelier currently is looking at anything other than new tax. So I think it's important to have some balance in the school board and if we have candidates that have qualifications that help balance out that side of the equation. Mm -hmm. I would say that would be a good addition to the school board and, and probably all of the people here tonight would be good addition. But that's where I see a future. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah, I'll make a comment. Um, yeah, I'm Jake Pittman. I just, I'm a former board member now, um, resigned just to become a head of track coach. Um, so one thing that I just kind of wanted to offer to the candidates that spoke, but also the select board itself is, um, you know, it, it is so great to hear many of you, you know, offer all of your personal expertise based on various other life ventures that you've been through. But I, I do just want to make it clear that, you know, the processes that exist today at the board level, like in real time during a board meeting is, you know, we have an administrative team that comes forward after doing hours upon hours of work in which we pay them well to do, and they come forward and they and they show what they've what they've worked on. They, they, they present scenarios, especially when we talk about the budget. And um, it is up to that board of directors to then have a healthy and enriched discussion about what has been brought forward. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because. It's, it's great to hear that so many of these candidates have this, this background expertise, perhaps from like a financial perspective or even in education itself. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it takes quite a lot for a, just a, a, a regular board member to actually, actually bring a motion to the table to suggest like a very significant and tangible idea that they have. That they really have to put forth a motion and perhaps even be scheduled on the agenda to do that. So one of the other reasons I'm saying this is because I, I just want the select board to understand that general like debate and communicative skills among board members might be a little bit more valuable than you think. So, you know, keep in mind when you're making your recommendations and you're talking it over, you know, making your motions in a few moments from now, then the ability for a school board member to come to the table and have a healthy, respectful discussion is very valuable. A, a school board member that just comes to the table and just says, I have this idea, this idea, this idea, this idea. That's not how the system works. There needs to be a proper structure for which that board member makes a motion to present these ideas. So I just wanted to offer that perspective. It's something that I thought of while hearing all these candidates speak. And you know, just, just know all four candidates here that it's quite, it can be a little bit cumbersome and difficult to, to really make your ideas come to fruition. It takes a lot of planning and execution. It's a lot more complicated than just raising your hand during a board session and saying, here's my idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jake, and thank you for serving. We appreciate it. Uh, Chris. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks for the candidates that came forward tonight. Um, a lot of you had good comments. Um, in response to Jake's comments as well, you know, I've looked at this thing over a long period of time. Uh, lived here in this area all my life. I've struggled. I've seen friends struggle with the economy from 50 years ago. A lot of people weren't familiar with and the wages that paid people to back then. And the efforts to make yourself secure for the days when you get older, buy yourself a home, create a family, have a good business or a good job, and hope to die where you grew up and raised your family. Watching the education system go on over the years, uh, having been gone to Harwood, uh, what appears to me now that we've started out with a campfire that's now become a forest fire. And Smokey the Bear is nowhere in sight. And this forest fire, as to the young lady's comments, I'd like to know a little bit more about what you see coming in the next four years, because I've been trying to stay on top of a lot of this stuff for some time. And if you've got more information, I'd like to hear it. Um, it's going to burn a lot of people out of their homes. And to my point, I don't know if you were at the Wakefield uh, bond meeting, bond discussion, you must have heard me say it then. The kids that are going through the school system now, I said it down, I'll say it again. When they come out of that school, I hope the jobs that are available in this state have the income levels that will they will be afforded to have to be able to afford to live here. Because as we continue to burn ourselves out, uh, <coughs> so it's going to become harder and harder to live here. Mm -hmm. And if we want them children to stay here, boy, God help us, it's going to become now. Um, so the system's broke. Not, probably some people aren't going to want to hear this, but I encourage everybody to continue to vote down the budget and budgets across the state until it gets forced back to the state house. And even then, that's where I believe the problem started. We can't let them just take it again and feed us a bunch of crap like, oh, consolidate your schools and everything will be okay. As far as I'm concerned, it didn't make a tingle of damn difference. Because look where we are now. So I wish the four board members, whichever three of you get, uh, you know, get elected tonight, wish you all the best of luck. If you're up against the valley, was where I originally came from. I moved back here when my mom was here all her life. I was back here when I was 17 and stayed here. But I can tell you right now, you've got some strong headwinds over there when it comes to pushing back on on uh on everything everything that they want you know yeah. thanks thanks Chris any other comments now for one last thing uh okay. just just to be clear just for everyone's knowledge if, if the budget is voted down again by law the district needs to operate at 87 I believe percent of it of last year's budget yep. which would be cash shock if you don't want to see staff cuts or you don't want to see very many staff cuts, oh boy, when you see them, then it would be a catastrophe if the budget failed. Okay, thanks. Uh, motion from the board. Uh, yeah, I'll go first. I'm going to put you your last name. Uh, uh, I, uh, I would make, make a motion. Uh, that we recommend Dan uh, should I perhaps call me again? Rossioli. Rossioli uh, for an appointment to the school board. All right, do I have a second? Okay. All right, moved and seconded. Further discussion? Uh, Dan made a commendable uh, presentation. Uh, certainly got some great ideas uh, to support his nomination. Any others? Any other discussion? 
So I would, okay, so we're not voting. How's everybody voting on that motion? Uh, he well, he just moved one, one candidate, so That's I guess. That's what we can vote. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, we'll just take him out one at a time. Yeah, Mike. Well, I just wanted to, it sounded like you were looking at other, other motions. Uh, we could only do one motion at a time. So okay. we have a motion on the table. I yeah, let's move and second. I, I move the question. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Dan, congratulations. Thank you. All right. Do I have another motion? Mike. I make a motion. Don't get me right if it's wrong. Uh, Elise, Elise Brown, is it? Elizabeth Brown? Uh, Elizabeth, yeah. Thank Difficult you. person. Is. My, my dear, senior dear, I make a motion that we uh, nominate her for uh, uh, our recommendation to the school board for uh, Waterbury's nominee, for Waterbury's uh, representative. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. Moved and seconded. Uh, further discussion? Again, uh, okay. So, so, uh, I'll stay first, and then we can go. I was just going to, um, looks like, um, uh, Jake's comments on his last comment here, uh, reflecting on the, if the school board vote gets, if the budget gets voted down again, how catastrophic that would be. And for all the folks who we recommend the school board uh, tonight, just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. For the discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Elizabeth, congratulations. Doctor? Yes. Um, isn't it true, Jake, that it's June 30th that the school board yeah. has to be developing here? Yeah. So not necessarily yeah, I, the next is. budget is the death of no vote, 87%. Yeah. They, they, they've got time to get to the end of June before the budget has yeah. to be adopted. So you don't have to necessarily vote yes on the next one for stalling the You might have another chance to vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Nominated two, we've got one more to go. Uh, I'd like to also say that we have other openings uh, on various other committees so that if you don't get nominated, for this, uh, there'll be other opportunities, and I, fair, uh, I su suspect that there'll be also opportunities coming forward. Uh, so if we don't get nominated this year, there'll be an opportunity coming up uh, yeah, next year. Can I ask a question? So if you're like, did, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a bit of a fallacy in this process right now. Mm -hmm. What happens to the candidate that just doesn't get motions for consideration at all right now? They, they don't get voted on. Uh, well, we only have three people. I would give similar to what you alluded to with the school board. We are using our select board process, which is what we've used in the past for appointments. I recognize that it may be flawed or imperfect, but our process for appointments to various boards and commissions for Tom's things has been to hear from the relevant candidates and then and the select board member is able to make a motion around their recommendation. So we will take the sum of the recommendations from the motions this evening and share that with the school board. Okay. Mike. And Jay, our, our recommendation is purely just that the school board can do what they want. They don't yeah. agree with what our recommendations <laughs> are. They can do something else. Cool. Okay. But, so they, they're asking, I think they, Typically, historically, have accepted the recommendations of the select board, you know, you know, for school board appointments. Okay. Any other motions? Yeah. Okay. okay. I would move to recommend Corey Hackett to the school board for consideration. I'll second it. Okay. Corey Hackett moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, Corey, congratulations. Thank you. All right.
And Dan, thank you for coming forward. Um, there'll be other opportunities, I think, going forward uh, if you are interested in serving. Thank you. If you want to know more about um, natural disasters, I can open it on that. A shameless plug. Hey, I got a, a hole to plug. I mean, new people. All right. So, Tom, uh, do you want to forward our nominations to the to uh, the superintendent? Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, next on the agenda is to adopt the rules of procedure. Uh, um, followed by the project. <laughs> We have before us the rules of procedure. Specific to the specific to the uh, vicious dog hearings. Do I have a motion? I move to adopt the rules of procedures for the rules of procedure uh, for select board vicious dog wolf hybrid hearings as written. Do I have a second? I'll second it with the note that the intent of the rules is just to provide a clear outline process so that we can explain to everyone and we'll go through them. But yes, second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Um, we can provide written copies to everyone, but it just outlines the process of how we would hold this hearing. The emphasis is that all of the comments are directed at the chair who runs the hearing. Um, we have an opportunity to accept comments. Um, and then this is one where we do have the option for to close the hearing, either continue it to a date certain um, or delivery um, and come back after. And uh, notably, um, the uh, procedure for a uh, domestic uh, pet uh, wolf hybrid hearing shall be considered in the following sequence. Uh, open the hearing by reading the warning or notice of the hearing. B, read the complaint received and remind all present that the hearing is mandated by the state law and will be conducted uh, in an orderly manner. C, that the uh, complainant respondent if he or she uh, has received the copies of the rules of procedure and whether he or she has uh, any questions about how the hearing will proceed and then direct the complainant uh, 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 or his or her representative uh, on all other providing evidence thereafter to step forward in, uh, in the following oath. Uh, and actually it goes on quite a ways after that. Anyways, it is written here, and we do have uh, the full sequence of events. We need to sign this before it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so we will have to sign this. Uh, we still need, to, still need to pass the motion. Uh, yeah, we do have to pass the motion. Um, any further discussion? Yeah, Mike. Just one real quick thing, and I don't know if it's just something I kind of missed somewhere. Has there always been vicious dog wolf hybrid, or is that something that's been added the wolf hybrid part to the regulations? I've always seen it that way. It's always been okay. I, I think mean, it matches the animal control. I, mean, I, 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 I thought so, but wasn't sure. They probably you. added because of the presence of wolf yeah, hybrids. Yeah, wolf hybrids has kind of been a somewhat re more recent kind of phenomenon. Okay. Any further discussion on the uh, rules of procedure? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The rules of procedure are passed. I will sign off by Ms. Kelby. Okay, and now uh, we'll, we'll go move right into the vicious dog hearing. Yep, I can introduce it real quick. He didn't have a written right. submission ready for this one, but the hearing pertains to 
Uh, the, the hearing was requested by Jonathan Hammer and his spouse. Um, the hearing pertains to dogs that live at 55 North Main Street, Apartment 3, which is right on the corner of Main and Butler. Um, there were five dogs in the apartment, to my knowledge. Uh, there were five dogs registered to that address um, just this past Friday. Um, Mr. Hammer, I think, can come up and, and tell a story. Um, so let's get you the, just to hold the record, please. Uh, for the record, my name is Jonathan Hammer. Um, my wife and my children have been mauled at by several dogs occasionally. Um, they haven't attained any wounds, but they do keep getting jumped on. There's two people that um, I found out that have been bitten in the building. And my concern is that my wife and children will be the next victims of me then. So that's why I look to you guys to, mm -hmm. you know, possibly have something done about it. So it's not just being let go. So. And do you know the owners of these dogs? These two right here? Um, personally? No. Don't mind. But I do know their names, but mm -hmm. on a personal level, I don't. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions for Jonathan? Yeah, uh, Alyssa. Can you just describe what your response has been to the situation, so what has happened and what you've done um, I've as let, a result? I've let the property manager know. I've also have let Tom know. And that's basically that's what I've done. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Mike. Are the Dog owners also renters in the same complex as you? Yes, we are. Yes. I'm not a vet home income on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so has this been brought up to the property manager? I'm the property manager. Okay. Yeah. Have, have you dealt with? I have. Well, yes. I have. Well, I so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go it's just an order of procedure. Yeah. We need to have one uh, witness testifying at a time. So, so uh, we'll, we'll ask her to come up after John. We're done questioning John. Yeah. Well, and he kind of John, made... thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Uh, the property manager, I didn't get your name. Colleen Nelson. Yeah. Come forward, Chris. Yeah. I have an issue. I haven't talked with them about the dogs uh -huh. attacking the tenants or people walking by. We've had a lot of problems. I've had a lot of complaints from people walking by that are afraid of the dogs. They'll be walking their dogs or just walking. Their dogs will charge at them. Uh, uh, they're on leash? leash. They're always on a leash. But they'll charge at them. Uh -huh. But um, I have something notices. Or giving them notices and talk with them when they moved in the dogs were supposed to be gone by the end of that week and that was in se september 10th they're supposed to be gone september 10th yes that's what they told us that they were going to be gone uh yeah Tom. pauline how big is the apartment it's a three a three room apartment one bedroom one living room one kitchen one bathroom in a small closet. So it's a one bedroom apartment? Yes. And there's five dogs, as far as I know, five adults and two children living in that one apartment. Mm -hmm. They have been evicted. They were, are supposed to be leaving by May 3rd. 
that uh, eviction notice has gone. Uh, we went for it last week, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. well, any other questions for Paula? Yeah, Mark. Are there any, in, in their leases, are there any restrictions for what kind of pets can? Yes, there is, but they didn't sign a lease. They didn't sign a No, they didn't. The, I didn't run it, it out to them. The owner made the agreement with them and things fell through. So they're living on a month to month. They aren't paying, they haven't paid any rent since they moved in. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Polly, right, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. you taking the time. All right. Any uh, anyone else want to testify before we bring the dog owners forward? Doctor, please. Yeah, all the way to the back there. Come forward, please. Uh, I'm Ethan Carter. I was at the time staying up in, I don't know which department number it is, but I'm number two. Number two. Thank you. I was staying at uh, number two at the time, spending a couple weekends there. Um, personally, I had been bitten by, in the butt by the dog. I had to go to the doctors and get a tetanus shot, and they were not <clears throat> telling me if they were registered or had any shots or anything like that sort. So it was kind of scary for me and my foster family. And um, as a DC, uh, former DCF child, I am scared for the children that are in the home more than the people that walk around the building. I just know that dogs are not fixed and not have their shots and just a bunch of other stuff that's going on. I'm not going to mention because it's not a problem, but just dogs in general, that's just not safe to have around children who aren't fixed. And I feel like that's like really bad. And it just really puts me in like an uncomfortable spot. And just knowing my position, I would. I wouldn't know what it's like to be in that type of position, which is screaming and barking and accusations, dogs biting people. It's just personally for me, that's not a good influence as a parent. I feel I would have my dogs on a leash at all times. They would have their shots before even entering the apartment. I would have my kids completely away from the dogs if I knew they didn't have shots. I just think the whole thing is a whole mess. And I think there's just it's not okay to me. Um so. Deacon, thanks for coming forward. Uh, questions, Alyssa? Ethan, did you or anyone else report the bite to anyone? Um, I had a couple of employees who also reported the bite. I also had somebody who's living in the apartment, uh, like right now, who's also living in the apartment and had to report the bite. What? Question for you. Um, you said you went to the doctor and you had, you gave your tetanus shots. Yeah. Is, is there evidence that the dogs were rabies vaccinated and did he so do anything in terms of rabies? Um, no, not in terms of rabies. I uh, just got tetanus shots. I'm aware of a single shot. Um, when I was sent home after that, he did ask me questions if I knew like anything about that sort, which I did not. And so I had to get a hold of somebody named Bill Sheplock, I believe it was. That's what he is, right? He's our hell of a And uh, that's how that went. Thank you. Like the dogs are, uh, do have valid rabies vaccinations. They were, okay. they were, you may recall, two weeks ago um, at the end of the meeting, the select board authorized me to issue tickets right. as the animal control officer. So I had told the dog owners that I would issue tickets of $50 a day per dog if the dogs were not vaccinated by today. If, uh, sorry, if the dogs are not registered by today, they were in fact registered Friday. Right. So that's been taken care of. Thank you. Uh, Bill Shuffler, uh, yes. Long Island Health Office. Bill, I'm not Bill Shuffler, the uh, health officer. Uh, Mr. Carter did call me. Um, typically, when somebody goes to a, a medical facility and, and gets treated for a dog bite, the medical facility contacts the town clerk or the, or the health officer directly. That didn't happen. <clears throat> Mr. Carter did get a hold of me. Uh, I contacted uh, the clinic that uh, he went to, um, and they did ultimately send information to Karen at the Town Clerk. clerk. Uh, I processed that. I don't recall the owner's names offhand, but I did speak to the owners. Uh, they admitted that the dog probably bit uh, Mr. Carter. Uh, I was told that they believe the dogs were um, had had their shots, but 
I couldn't ascertain that they were licensed. I'm just the health officer, not the animal control officer, so I couldn't issue any uh, any kinds of tickets. I worked with the owners and Karen to try to get them to come here to um, to register the dogs if they were not registered. And it sounds as if they weren't registered until Thomas had to intervene. But the, 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 I just I'm just here to tell you that there was a report made to me. There was a bite, and it was um, corroborated by the medical facility that the, that Mr. Carter was bitten and that he had received a second shot. Um, I did tell the owners that um, you know best practice was to keep the dogs confined. Uh, they're supposed to be confined and under observation for ten days to make sure that they don't show any any signs of potential rabies. Um, and I followed up, and, and there was no uh, no indication that the dogs were uh, showing any kind of uh, argument. So that's my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions for Bill? No. Okay. Anyone else want to testify about this case? All right. Let's bring the owners up, please. <laughs> Who's your name? Christine Lyon. Tyler Lyon. Tyler Lyon. Tyler. 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 So we have a uh, testimony that uh, the dogs may not have been registered. Uh, but they are registered now. Uh, the, the, there was a dog bite that was verified by our town health officer. Uh, can you sort of state your case, please? Um, that dog that did bite, he, we did get rid of him. He was black and white, um, excuse me, brown and white. Um, he is my dog, Sassy's puppy. He's only a year and a half old. Um, I have Bella, who is also her puppy. Um, she's a year and a half. I keep my dogs on a leash when they're outside. Um, How many are there? There's, I have, there was six. There's five now. Because I got rid of the one that bit. Um, <clears throat> my dogs are the sweetest dogs. Unless you harm my, me or my children. Um, they're all fixed but one. Um, we lived in a hotel before moving to the, um, the apartment, and we lived there for two and a half years, and not once did anybody get bit nor complain about my dogs. Yeah, they bark. I have a dash hound Yorkie who barks. Um, I went to Walmart today and bought muzzles that, to stop the barking when they go out. Um, the neighbors will go by the door when we first moved in and bark because my dogs would bark, so they would bark back at the dogs. Um, we have had issues with the neighbors since we moved in, the day we moved in. Um, there's been issues ongoing. We have never gotten along with the neighbors. They either stomp on their seat on their floor, which is on our ceiling. And like she said, go up, stomp up the stairs to get the dogs going or mocking the dogs. And we've had issues with them since day one. And we did sign a lease. It's just the the landlord, Michael Gray, didn't want want the lease or anything. He what happened with that is Tyler who worked in turn, Miss Kurt Zachary's, and um he felt that Tyler lied. Um, about a charge that he nah. eventually beat in court. Oh. Um, he was found not guilty. Um, we moved in Saturday and Tuesday. We were handed an eviction notice. Hmm. So, and then from Tuesday on. What, I'm the, sorry, which day is this? It's uh, September. September 10th, we moved in, which is, was a Saturday. That following Tuesday, Michael Gray fired 
okay. September 13th, fired Tyler and gave us an eviction notice. We he wanted us out. He offered us money to get out that day, five hundred dollars, and then offered us again twenty five hundred dollars to be out within a week and a half. Huh. Now, you you weren't gonna take it. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I, I didn't do we didn't do anything wrong at that point. They thought he thought it like she said she he thought I like about a 12 year charge that happened 12, 13 years ago. And then the recent charge that I beat out of court for an investment that I, I didn't do. Mm -hmm. He thought I lied to him when I told him on my interview. I did not I got arrested for this, going to court for this, I gonna beat it. He let me work for him two and a half months before moving into the apartment. Um. You, then, then I moved to the apartment, still worked in Berlin, and then for two days here in town. <clears throat> and that Tuesday at 11 o'clock, I went to clock in, he told me I couldn't clock in, and he gave me my two checks that I was able to. And then, and then said, that we have to leave. Um, we begged and begged, at least for the boys and I to stay. Um, I, I would have left and just her and, and my son and his little brother. I'm not going to see them on the street. I'm a, I'm a grown ass man. Sorry about the language. I will live on the street. No, I don't want her or the kids to. And we went to hand them the money. And Colleen wouldn't take it. Wouldn't take it. So she couldn't, when Michael said something, yeah, I guess we put the name wrong or something. The name wrong, they, they couldn't take the money anymore. So. Oh. Well, and the focus of this real discussion is so more about the dog. Yes, it, 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 it's, focus more about. I feel that you guys get a phone call the day our eviction is final. Mm -hmm. If my dogs were that much of an issue, why are you guys just finding this out seven months later? Well, Tom, when did you first get to comment on this? Um, probably been working towards this hearing for three or four weeks. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned something to me, it was at least a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that's, that's what Mike was talking about. Other questions? Mike. I just have a question. It just seems unusual that when you went into the property that you would have signed some sort of release before you got in. Why did that not take that would for, that protects your rights as well as the landlord? They they gave us when we moved in. I got the key at the restaurant, and we all sat down to sign the lease. And I went and brought it down to Berlin. He didn't want to sign it. He didn't want, want to do nothing. He moved that up here to Waterbury when I was work, had to because I worked, was working at both different spots. Twin City Lanes in and Berlin. Over here. Okay. Both and up here. He didn't want to sign do anything down in Berlin. He wanted to do everything up here because that's where he was living in apartment six. At the time, did he not want you to move in? No, well, he let us all move in and everything. Well, like I said, we were living in a hotel. Okay. I and I started working for him, and I'm like one of his other employees. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, I was just going to comment the purpose of this hearing about the blog. Did somebody and we have complaints about it? Uh, and you claimed, um, that Christina, I'm sorry, uh. That the dog who indeed did the biting no longer resides on the premises. Yeah, so. um, Loki. He's... What happened to the dog? Um, I gave him away. All right. Any other questions? Um, hmm? That black and white one was just there the other day. Mm -hmm. I saw him right out the window. My wife has a picture of him. He's, no. uh, he's, he's brown and white. He's brown and white. He's, he's, not, he's there. not there. The black and white one, he's the nicest dog we have. On the other side of the way. There's two brown and white ones. Yes, I have Sassy and I have Bella. <clears throat> and we have now registered for five, five dogs are registered? Yeah. Okay. And they're all shots, all shots. Yes. Okay. Um, and do we have a motion from the board, or do we can take this into a little bit of session if we want to? Yeah, I would just 
If we have an instance of a specific dog biting a specific person, and we have the evidence of the dog biting the person, we know which dog it was, and the dog has been relieved of its ownership. Um, I think outside of that, there's not a whole lot, right? Besides, besides going by the book, that we can do. Right? Mm -hmm. We can't go to the extreme and take a dog away because they're there. No, but we can impose fine if we want to. Depends on how, how we look at the case now. Like, how do we look at there was a period of time that there's a problem? And right. I don't know where we look at the finding period in Tom to, you know, because I know as Kane just said, there's a little discrepancy. The same one party is saying that the dog is no longer there, and the you know, so, neighbors are saying, it's been back. Well, he also said that he's been sort of the other dogs have jumped on him. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so, no, so when they when they the other day. No, we'll have Jonathan talk first. The, the other day, my wife was coming back in from letting take this out of the school bus, and they were letting the dogs out. One of them escapes right from their apartment and jumps right on the way. I mean, this is the stuff that you know I'm trying to avoid of you know having my wife get mauled or my kid get mauled. You know, there's steps and stuff like that is around there, which you know, if my kids or my wife trip down, you know, the stairs, that's an issue. And you know, this is stuff I'm trying to avoid. Um, it's nothing against you guys or your dogs. It's just you need to have control. There obviously is. Oh, what? Uh, tell you some of Oh, in the back. Oh, That's okay. Good. Pauline, stop. Yeah. If the dogs aren't vicious, then when I go over with the repair man or whatever, we have to go in. Why do you lock them in the bathroom and stand and hold the bathroom door shut? We don't hold the bathroom door shut and ask for that. And Roger, it's on us as the board. This shouldn't be an attack on individual people. So if you have comment, Pauline, I'm going to ask you to direct it to Roger as the okay. chair, and these folks will also direct it comment to us. The goal is the one. Well, yeah. if the dogs aren't vicious, mm -hmm. when I go over with a repair man or whatever, and I go in, Tyler locks the dogs in the bathroom and he stands there and holds the bathroom door shut. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would assume that there's a reason if they're not vicious. And Tom, Barbara Lowe was supposed to have sent you a, a paper or something because she couldn't be here. We, we, we can talk on the phone. Oh, but... yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so listen. I want to ask if you have anything else to we, add that has been covered. We keep that locked up for the accusations right here. Yeah. 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 Are they always on leashes? When They're they always on leashes, even before yeah. I, I open my, my apartment. Well, we've heard some testimony that they have jumped on kids coming off of school buses or they, something to that effect. Is that is that true? Yes, you? but they pat them. His wife has pat, patted my husky. <clears throat> so I don't understand. Both, both kids have pat, patted our husky and Bella. The, Bella, which is the year and a half old, and then mm -hmm. our black and white one. They, they all, even John has. Oh. All right. Um, and from what I understand, also, uh, you have received an eviction notice. Are you planning to leave yes, your apartment? Yes, we're leaving state May 3rd. May 3rd. Yes. But can I ask yeah. why, why would they be taking pictures of our windows? We take pictures from their windows and from other spots in the, around the property because since they moved in 
Your dogs have gone out on the lawn and at the neighbor's lawn and used it as the bathroom. I have on my phone numerous pictures. They have cleaned it up. They've done a good job of cleaning it up lately, but all winter it was just dog feces all over. Mm -hmm. And the neighbors, Scott Brooks' property too, and um, they need to clean that up too. But it's, it was, that's why we've taken pictures. I have, and I have them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alyssa. So for, um, I'm wondering if Tom should share his feedback publicly as part of this hearing, and then I was gonna move to close this hearing if there is another comment, and we'll, we can discuss more in deliberative session. So the name Barb Lowe was mentioned, I did speak with her. She she echoed Jonathan's comments that the dogs sort of jump on her and she lives in fear of them. Um, but that was the general general statement that that she feels like it's a problem waiting to have. Some more, I think, Jonathan sentiment. We could also take, there's two doors to go up my apartment. We can take them out because the second door is in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. For the last month, we're there. Okay, Mike? Just for the record, um, what are the breeds of all the dogs that are there? And like, kind of what size are they? Pitbull, people mix. I have a Dutch Hound Dorky that that has since 2017. And he's in the in past your ankle. Yeah, well, he's 25 pounds. And he's the one that you'll hear. He is the barker. Um, and then I have a six month old Samarian Husky. If there's no more testimony, I think we've got a reasonable picture of what happened. Uh, appreciate the fact that you folks have, have taken some measures to get your dogs uh, registered uh, and uh, keep, keep them on leash. Uh, we do have some testimony indicating that there certainly was a problem uh, before, and certainly we, we hope that there's not going to be a problem going forward. Um, I think we will take this into deliberative session uh, after we close the meeting tonight, uh, and uh, you'll be here in person. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Um, now we have uh, a number of uh, permits. Is anyone representing 100 on 100? No? It went in Zoom. Anyone on Zoom? 100. 100 on 100. No? No. We do have the um, permit request. Uh, from Evan Dulecki. Do I have a motion? With the, a, a uh, relay -like course that's been run for a number of years that comes through the uh, town of Waterbury uh, in, uh, on August 10th, Saturday. Usually in the morning. I believe last year there were some comments on the safety of runners and drivers alike. And they had addressed those then, but I didn't see anything addressing that yet. Okay. Um, last year, Committed to memory. This is the 18th year they've been running it. Yeah. As I recall, there was conflicts with like it was the car show weekend and concerned about oh, what happened okay, well, on that same that day. Okay. I will say, I'm they are indicating this is actually your comment. Yeah. 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 There we go. There you go. <laughs> um, noting that it was a busy weekend, but in terms of notes. Well, it's, it's not even that. It's, uh, it's the goers that are participating in, in the vehicles that follow this 100 on 100 from starting the snow area through Waterbury down. So as soon as they get out of the Waterbury village, it's a, a matter of uh, 
where they try to travel park, where they're moving. Um, really no understanding of anything that the, the path in which they're going, nothing's really fed up to the public. So as everybody knows, I, I work at Bell Mobile on the weekends and I've had it for three decades and I know it's this this race has been on forever. You know, so we've always dealt with it. It's just a matter of I'm just hoping that you know, as these organizers continue and that traffic on that road gets busier and busier and busier every year, that they take the opportunity to, you know, advertise a little better, maybe some police presence or something to, you know, um, not to halt it, but just to make sure that the safety of the occupants and the people that are in it, you know, are, are taken care of. Mm -hmm. And this uh, route has them uh, using the uh, Waterway Community uh, Rec Path. So they avoid being on Route 100 uh, while they're in uh, Waterway, except for uh, going across the bridge over into uh, Duxbury Moortown. Which is good, but in your mm -hmm. past, it's coming right directly down 100. And yeah. They need to turn, to turn on to on the Stowe Street and down through that direction. So yeah. if, a, if a path change is made, that may be one of the yeah, things right. that they put into place to make it better. And it looks as though they, they were listening to you, Scott. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this is uh, probably the busiest street here is uh, Stowe Street. Well, and I would just say they know that there will be police officer present monitoring runner and vehicle traffic at the 100 crossing as specified, as well as um, runner outfits and the like. So um, I will go ahead and move to approve the 100 on 100 event on uh, August 10th as out. Okay. Second. Moving second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We'll issue them a permit. Okay. Next on the agenda is the Circus Marcus. It's uh, David Merman. Hi. Hi. I'm Alan Lambert. I'm uh, uh, on Zoom here with our operations director and our administrative director, and I'm the tour general manager for Circus Marcus. Yep. Thank you for coming on. Uh, could you just explain uh, the uh, how many days you'll be uh, operating and what measures you're taking to assure public safety? Um, oh, so I can I can take that. Um, so we'll be there um, performing three days, and um, we perform two shows per day. Um, every show is, is at from one to three, and then again from six to eight. Um, in the pat, we were there last year at Fars Field, and um, we were working with uh, Fire Chief Gary Dillon. He did not recommend that we uh, employ a fire detail, nor a police detail, nor an EMT detail. What we do to ensure public safety is we um, have several employees trained in crowd control. Um, we also have many employees trained with CPR and, and, um, first aid. And then we have volunteers who assist us with parking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and have you had any, uh, issues that you'd like to, uh, call our attention to and how you've dealt with them? Nate may be able to speak better to that. I've never had, I don't think that we've ever had a public safety issue, but Nate, but you can maybe speak to that. Uh, yeah, public safety issues, uh, we've not really had. Um, every once in a while, we have a performer uh, who, you know, has a slight injury. Um, but we take care of that. Um, I think probably the biggest thing last year, obviously, we had the flooding of that field uh, with the uh, the river right next to it. And um, yeah, so we're, we're, we always monitor weather, we monitor lightning strikes and weather in the area, uh, but definitely we'll be keeping an eye on any rain that's coming our way and definitely be thinking about that. Really. Um, and hopefully we won't have, have anything like what we had last summer. But um, as far as public safety stuff goes, um, we have not had anything in the past. And Nate, can we get your full name just for the record? Sure, my name's Nathaniel Dubrule, D-U-B-R-U-L-E. Well, 
Other questions? Have you been in touch with uh, Gary Dillon uh, this year? Not yet. I was waiting to get permission from the town. Mm -hmm. But you do intend to uh, be in touch oh, with definitely. him? Definitely, yes. Um, because it, uh, Gary will be out or send someone out to inspect our tents. So we get um, the state inspectors out um, from the Waterbury office, and I've been in touch with them, uh, and then we'll have Gary come out and inspect the tent as well. And about how many uh, people uh, do you accommodate at each show? We can seat what we call butts in seat. We can put uh, 745 in the tent at one time. That's for a totally sold out show. I would think we try to limit it to around 700 to 720. Um, I don't recall the numbers last year. I do think that we had a couple of sold out shows. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, adequate parking at Farfield for uh, all those shows? We expect okay. maximum, um, probably 275 cars. We usually ask to plan for 250. I don't think that it's, ex I don't know that we've had, at Farfield, we definitely haven't had trouble last year with parking. Right. So there was no flood. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Just as someone who attended one of the evening shows last year, I think they did a great job of plenty of parking, uh, good um, access in the tent. It was, I think it was a sold out show, but uh, people were able to come and go if they needed to get out rather easily without, you know, uh, being, uh, being felt like they couldn't get out of there if there was any kind of uh, issue and uh, very efficient when it came time to leave. So I think they just did a great job. All right. Well, yeah, okay. Very good testimony from the town health officer. Thank you. Um, Appreciate it. Do I have motions? Yeah, no, no. Super good question. Do you, do you have, do you use your own tents and facilities or do you have a, a tent company that you're in employ? Nate, you want to so take we, we, yeah, we, we have all of our own trailers and tents. Uh, we bring the big top and the midway tent and our backstage tent, and we set it all up, and we're there for a couple of days, and we take it down and go somewhere else. So we, we're we a complete complete package. We travel by ourselves. Okay. Do you, do you also have, um, are there any concerns from the landowner? Like, for instance, if we have flooding, or not flooding, but say if it's kind of wet or muddy on the field, is, is there any restrictions by, by the by the uh, leasing of, of the field? John Farr, no. John Farr has, has been willing to work with us. And we were off the fields without, I don't know, Nate, you can attest to the damage that might have been done last year, but I think we were off just prior to the, the rains. Yeah, we left, we left two days before the floods happened. And uh, we did work closely with him to ensure that we took a route across the field that was not going to damage it because he was definitely very worried about um, they had a dog show coming like the next weekend or something. And I guess it's a big to do. So uh, he was very worried about the, the state of the field after we left. Um, but, uh, but as far as I know, he was, he was very happy with the way we left it. Thank you. He agreed to uh, lease to us again this year without any, there were no other stipulations. So I believe, I don't think he was unhappy. Any other comments? So I have a motion. I move to approve the entertainment permit for service service for the days of July 2nd through the 4th. Second. Motion seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations. You have your permit. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time. Bye. Bye. All right. Wata. The gravel grinder. The flash. Uh huh. All right. Uh, please state your name for the record. Yes, Keith Michonne, uh, president of WADA, uh, Waterbury Residence. All right. And 
Can you please explain uh, how, what safety precautions so you're going to implement in order to make sure that you have a uh, safe uh, gravel grinder? Yeah, of course. Um, so essentially the, it's the, it's our sweet 16 edition of this gravel grinder. It's the 16th year. We missed one year during the pandemic, otherwise we've gone straight through. Um, so it really has been 16 years of thankfully not having any real mistakes, but tweaking the process, the plan, the route year after year. Um, we have two routes that we use. Um, it's probably 60, 40. Uh, this year we're hoping for 350 to 400 participants total. Um, so a couple of things we've done as the, as the event has grown is split up that group. Everyone used to leave in a mass start. Now we have two different groups. They begin a half hour apart. Um, we intend to best case scenario, have a state trooper do that, um, that departure to help maintain traffic. And essentially the, um, home base will be at Rust Parker. And so we leave out, uh, railroad street on the show street over to Perry Hill road. And then folks start to spread out and disperse once you get to the Perry Hill road. State troop comes back as the second group. That's the main first piece. Um, and then the route itself, we, we stay to as many back roads as we can. Um, we do not cross Route 100, which is a huge aspect that we like to avoid. Um, and then on the, uh, the extended side, so folks will go Waterbury, Waterbury Center, up in Stowe, up in Stowe Hollow and back. They do a big, great loop. And then um, folks who will continue out in the Town. it's on some class four roads mostly back roads and we try to stick to have as many right turns as possible on any busy stretches. Uh, and when we can't do that, when you're making a loop, we just make sure that we've, we've adjusted the route so that you have complete visibility on from the traffic so there's no blind turns. Um, the other piece, we do have uh, um, course marshals at major intersections. Um, and then also um, prime all the riders with email notifications and information about a month before the event. So in the next week or so, look at their first notifications about etiquette, um, rules of the road, things like that, so that they know they have to be good stewards of uh, local traffic and be respectful of all things larger and heavier than them. Questions? Oh, sorry, one other uh, major thing, I apologize. We let know all EMS and ambulance, fire and police um, well in advance of the ride. All of them have been notified so far. Haven't gotten positive confirmation back, but they've all been reached out to for like all the times we cross into. Like no real questions. I really appreciate the thoroughness of your submission. I wish they were all like this. Appreciate it. Yeah, Lou, thank you. Can I just get a little clarification? Yes. I'm seeing Sunday, May 7th, and that's uh, the same. It is May 5th. Great thank passion. You. Thank you. I'll put that right down. Oh, I think that has been caught. It's changed in there now. Okay, great. I have no question. Thank you. And um, we'll be back with um, vendor and DLC permit applications the next meeting. And Rusty Park Park Reservation has it's, all been done. It's all been submitted. I believe yeah. that confirmation is contingent on this, right? Just making sure it was in progress. Mm -hmm. Other questions? No. Uh, motion. I have a, I have a comment. Uh, yeah, Scott. Okay. So I guess my comment is I'm a Perry Hill resident. Yes, sir. So from the Stowe Street coming on to Lincoln, Lincoln to Perry, mm -hmm. that is a very long, steep, windy road. Yeah. As a resident up there, I'm always surprised that this function is even going on because there's really no advertisement on that hill to let anybody know that okay. this event is going on. Sure. And when it does, it, it's um it's up the hill or wide into those windy corners and there are a lot of people that come in the, up and down that hill on Saturday yeah. every day now but it's just one of those deals where for the public safety things and the, and the safety of your participants I don't know what the, the rules of the road is for your your gravel driver setup and half portion from Lincoln to your you know your off the Perry Hill section mm -hmm. but that would be a suggestion that I would have. And I did bring this up last year okay. also because, I mean, I mean, even the a garbage scenario last year at the bottom of my driveway, which I cleaned up. Thank you. But that's very, very minimal compared to somebody losing a life or someone coming around the corner and having to ditch their vehicle down over a bank or in the embankment, not clean out a, a road, you know, 
Four rows of white is white. Perfect. Yeah, and, and two of grass is the wall. We yeah, so and like I, said, I can assure you the yeah. last few years, that's not always been the case. From yeah. the Tyler Ridge section, yes. up past to you start the, the, the large pond to the to the dirt road up on top. Yep. That's not always the case. And I live on that steep hill. Okay. Area, so would um would like signage within the four foot right away the week before? I think anything I think right. anything would be better than nothing. Sure. And like I said, I mean, I, I applaud you for doing it. It's a lot of work. I understand. I think it's a great event. And I want to see, you know, that accident and injury happen due to some of you know, due to uh, the width of the, of the the path of your travel as well as as windy and blind as some of the Yeah, I agree. Yeah, something you don't want to see anywhere anybody else does. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, those agreements, do we have a motion? I move to approve WADA's permit uh, for the gravel grinder on May 5th. Yes. <clears throat> Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good event. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Leaf Peeper. Half Marathon 5K, scheduled for Sunday, October 6th. Anyone here to address that? Anyone online for Leaf Peepers? Leaf Peeper? No? Okay, again, this is a race that's been run in and around our town for several years. Uh, race course this year looks as though similar to previous years, uh, going um, from the uh, horseshoe by State Complex, uh, and then going out on uh, Main Street, over into uh, Duxbury, and then out on River Road in Duxbury, all the way out. Uh, or coming back at the bridge for the 5K. And this is a uh, run on a Sunday morning. And 9 a.m. Uh, we keep our tap marathon 5K run for Sunday, October 6th. Moved. I have a second. Second. Moved and second. Further discussion. I applaud that they're delivering postcards to all houses on Main Street and River Road, though it's in our neighbor Duxbury, but for other events. Just just as a note, as a comment in the discussion, it would be nice when someone's applying for something like that they send a that representative that we could answer. I don't know if you can CC it. I will say the race director's email says, I would be happy to attend the meeting and answer additional questions. It right. notes that he has secured the state for the use of the version. So yeah. I agree. If we want to continue it. I feel comfortable with I this feel, mission. I feel comfortable, especially it's been held so many times before. So I don't have a lot of questions, but just as a general course, I think mm. Good to have a representative ask, ask, ask questions on what it could be. Yeah, I've heard some comments from res, uh, Duxbury residents, but they're not of our particular concern. Right. So, uh, motion seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations to the leaf papers. All right. And the last permit of the night. Uh, is the um, the uh, Little League Parade. Scott, come forward, please. Thank you for having me again this year. Sure. So I sent the um, the packet over. It's for you guys to review ahead of the meeting. I also sent it to Gary. Um, it's the same identical packet that you approved last year. Um, nothing changed except for the population of the number of individuals walking down the uh, the road from the DACRO facility to State Place. And uh, it's increasing to growing by about 22, mm -hmm. which okay. is great. 
Um, I'm going to hold the same format. Um, I have Matthew Nadeau, who's a VFP uh, detective of state police. Um, he's actually going to uh, line up the, uh, the the lead car for us. I've already reached out to Steve Harrington and his team there from the NS Transport. They're going to give me the two backer vehicles like they did last year. Um, I've got 21 volunteers this year, opposed to the 12 I had last year. I'll be reaching out to Celia Clark in regards to cones and I have vests already set up for my volunteers for traffic control. Um, we're going to follow the same detour route that we did last year, and we're going to have a continuous travel behind the parade as it goes. Um, we plan on setting it up at 12.30 down here at the backup facility, into the road by 10 minutes to 1, and in roughly 40 minutes, 35 minutes, depending on how little legs move and how everything else goes. We should be down on the other end, uh, having the kids check out the police car and, and disperse them by somewhere around 1 30, 1 45. This will be a rain or shine event, so I'll make sure we have proper attire as needed. And um, I'll make sure I have plenty of uh, information out to let everybody know when we're going to have this event. We scheduled it for the 11th of May. That will avoid the green up day and weekend because we know that's a heavy traffic time. and. I think we get another week into May and then help us with the impending weather that I'm dreading where they're supposed to be getting again. And uh, it's pretty much what I have to you guys. So whatever you have for questions or concerns, I'm more than happy to. Uh, did you have any uh, lessons learned from last year's? I had a couple of lessons learned. It was uh, placement of which groups still, smaller feet in the front, larger feet in the rear, that type of stuff. Um, having traffic coming to us and having them come to the side so the parking so that worked, worked out really well um the police presence was awesome and uh the trooper we had last year was uh was uh very impressed with the whole program and the way it was set up and i think it went off without a real good hitch the reason for the 10 more volunteers isn't because there's 20 more kids it's because i really felt that having those volunteers there it's just another hand, you know, another hand to carry. Mm -hmm. Especially when we try to we try to keep the Stowe Street, the dry bridge, and that stuff from people turning one way, and then it gives me two people there to watch each other's back, opposed to having one. So that's that's why we we up that number. And like I said, this is only year number two, but this yeah. parade has been going on for several years before that, and then dropped off, and we're just trying to bring back something. Uh, Something old to make it new again for the community. And uh, I may have missed it. Um, uh, any sort of uh, parade uh, announcement uh, on the days before? We're the actually, I'm actually in talks with WDUD right now. Mm -hmm. So we'll have some PSAs there and we'll put some signs up at the same time, which we did not do last year. So okay. that's another advancement. Yeah. As well as keeping with the social media piece in our website as we had. Um, also reach out to, to Lisa and make sure we can get it in the roundabout and, and uh, move forward from there. Okay. All right. Other questions? Uh, I will comment as I did last year on the stick figures. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the years I heard class that took. I, yeah, I think. <laughs> well, like I yeah. said, I've been doing traffic control for 30 plus years. So it's one of those deals where this comes first hand. But when you, you're talking about families and community members and children and Main Street on a Saturday, you know, you can't be can't be fair enough and safe enough. No, but just the way you drive, the way you drive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more more cold call over. There you go. Yeah. 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 I've been in the gym for them for three weeks, trust me, they go pretty fast. <laughs> Well, thanks for uh, again another complete packet. It makes it, uh, I think, it makes our work easier. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the Little League Parade for May 11. Second. Move and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, Scott. Congratulations. Thank we wish you the best of luck. And good weather. Richard Big Well, always the jerk here, isn't it? Thanks again. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, we have volunteer response team. Yeah. I got it. So, yeah. It was back sure also. Um, natural disaster preparedness committee. Your name for my name is Matthew. I'm sorry, Matthew. Um, hi. Thanks for making time uh, for me. 
I'm uh, here representing this brand new committee. We met three times and um, we have a request as of our third meeting. And so I'm just gonna read for brevity, which is something I assume you'll appreciate. Um, so our committee seeks select board permission to move forward with the process of creating a plan for the development and maintenance of a Waterbury Volunteer Corps. The committee has determined that given the many aspects of disaster relief and with our committee's capacity in mind, the establishment of this core represents a reasonable, actionable initiative that can address one of the most pressing issues with last year's floods, namely uh, lack of a sufficient number of trained volunteers to respond in the critical hours and days <clears throat> after the emergency phase of an event has passed. Uh, to be clear, the primary job of these volunteers would not entail emergency response. Rather, the core would be involved in cleanup activities. The working concept, and I want to stress that, um, we're, we're in brainstorming mode, uh, but for, for purposes of timeline, it would be very helpful to get approval for this effort sooner rather than later. Um, so the working concept is that this core will be comprised of block leaders who will oversee small teams of volunteers, the majority of whom will be recruited well in advance of disaster events. Block leaders would meet at least annually to assess the town's supply of cleanup tools, such as buckets, shovels, vinegar, etc., uh, to present updates on the volunteer roster and assess any needs, and to receive training on cleanup processes. In an emergency, a town-level uh, emergency official would provide information directly to block leaders whose responsibility it would be to um, in turn activate the volunteers to address needs at individual properties. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking this action and uh, also for, for the entire team for coming forward to address uh, what was clearly uh, become something that uh, Waterbury needs to uh, be taking action on. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, we never know when the next flood is coming, do we? So, uh, I'm sorry. First of all, let's uh, see if there are questions from the board. Mike. Are you looking to request, I know it's beyond the point of the budget, but in future budgets, requesting funding for the, this endeavor that you're proposing? Uh, no, no, not at not a, well, We could surely dream up something that we could have to spend money. <laughs> Everyone can. <laughs> right now, no. Okay, yeah. Um, that of course leads aside the the idea of the discussion we've had about supplies and a place to store them. Right. That's kind of where I was thinking because you, you kind of presented that, and there might be some cause for need. Right. Um, I would say that since we've met three times, there's there's so much we can and and have sort of talked about. Um, the most concrete thing we're thinking about right now is this. Four, and then we'll build one thing at a time after that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Do I have a motion? No, oh, I was, I was going to just comment and say um, that I've attended all three meetings. And once the committee zeroed in on something, they went for like the ideas started flowing. And then this response team immediately like went off, and I was like, um, "I think we have to ask this like commission on that." <laughs> so Matt decided to come in, and he wrote this whole thing up. And I was like, helping him spitball, and then all of a sudden, Matt emails me this: "This is what they'll do. This is who they talk to." And I was like, "Oh, wow, great!" <laughs> so I was really impressed by the committee so far. Wow, we, appreciate, we appreciate Kane a lot taking the leadership to get this all going, by the way. Well, and Melissa, you were uh, very much involved in the coordination of volunteers, uh, particularly in uh, July. Uh, do you have any observations that you'd like to uh, convey? 
I was going to make a joke about if anyone ever asked if they can create a plan, I'd like all the plans. <laughs> no, but but in all honesty, I guess I would say thank you. And and my reading of your quote around creating a plan is really doing that. It's just wanting to, one, again, thank you for coming in, but just saying like, we certainly won't have a plan if we don't create one. And I think just having a continuing dialogue, my follow-up question was going to be like, have you talked to the fire chief and people, but at least what I'm hearing of taking it to be is you're just starting them. So I want to make sure that all makes sense and you'll figure that all out and let us know. Yeah, yeah. As, as you can imagine, one conversation, and we've all had many with Liz Schlegel, will uh, send yeah. your brain in many, many different directions. Right. <laughs> so yeah, a lot, lot to learn, a lot to figure out, but we also want to do something that will help us be proactive. Getting two floods in six months is a really good reminder that it can happen again really fast. So we're, we're trying to at least bite off the discrete pieces and, and make some progress. And I'll say I feel like something we're thinking about as a board and just to figure out how it relates to this is the if and how this is used is just, I will say, the one big question in my mind, not to say there isn't many willing or reasonable and appropriate uses, floods or otherwise. Um, but I just would think in creating a plan, I would love to know. I think we're thinking about like what river forecast means what in terms of what we should be doing. And it's been seat of the pants thus far. But I think to the extent this can be one thing where there is a plan or just we've clearly outlined how it happens, um, that would be an important part of a plan. For mm -hmm. But mostly, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I can make a motion in this key next year. I'm in, right? Sure. Um, I move to approve the national uh, the natural disaster response committee's plan to create a volunteer corps. Second. Right. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, just uh, in terms of discussion, I'll also note that uh, Dr. Chris Kaliba, who's a previous uh, Waterbury resident uh, and uh, still has a, a position at UVM, asked if Waterbury had a plan for volunteer coordination. And I said that it was in progress, but that uh, this uh, will help hopefully advance that progress. Um, so I certainly support this initiative. Well, tell Chris that we're, we're former colleagues. Tell him I said hi. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't know he had that question, but uh, uh, yeah, he has a, a grant uh, from uh, I think it's NOAA uh, to uh, mm -hmm. study the interactions between uh, community reactions mm -hmm. to natural disasters. And uh, he uh, asked if, uh, if there was a community plan and there might be a certain way. I said, yeah, huh. maybe there will be. I will tell him that you're on, you're, you're at least taking on part of that. That's cool. So not to belabor you up, mm -hmm. you're very busy folks. He's moved, um, I, I understand all that, but he's still funded to do research in the Northeast? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, I serve on the committee that he's been leading here. We've got a meeting coming up sometime in the spring. You know, oh. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So perhaps there's a way that we can sort of bring this uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. support uh, some of his research. Okay, uh, move to second it. Any further discussion? I'm just saying we're not surprising, like creating this in the plan, but just to know, so like we'll circle back around what it means and how we're using it and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Okay, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you all. You have your sailing orders. Thank have you. Great time. Thank you for coming forward. All right, actually, we do have another uh, entertainment permit. Uh, and this is Rotary Concerts in the Park, submitted by Al Lewis. Uh, they have a list of, it looks like, about a dozen uh, programs. Al, is Al? It's right here. Oh, yeah, there he is. Hey, hey, Al. Al Lewis. I'm representing the Water Warriors of the Park Committee. Um, yeah, this is our first entertainment park. We've gone, uh, this will be 42nd year of uh, concerts in the park since we began in 1983. And uh, we've grown from five five concerts when we started to as many as 12. I think one year we had 13 concerts. Um, however, this year we've got nine. Yeah, and prior to COVID, we had about 10 to 12 concerts. <laughs> 
COVID kind of set us back. Uh, even though we held concerts during those years, we didn't hold the two years the concerts at Rusty Park. Um, but we did hold some concerts for the community. So we can say that we have a uh, continuous running concert program. I think it's the oldest continuous program in the state. Uh, that's what's been reported to me anyway. Started again in 1983. Um, our Rotary Club maintains the park. Uh, we we built almost all the facilities except the uh, monuments there. And uh, the way we look at the concerts, the uh, our club prepares what's necessary in order to uh, make sure the band can get the concert um, performance are uh, accommodated with everything that they need. We open the band stand up. We close the band stand up at the end of the evening. We police the park. Basically, the principle that we worked out with the village at that time when we built the park was whoever uses the park leaves it the way they said they, they found it. And that's what we do with the Rotary Club. Um, during the season, there are going to be a number of other events go on. And now that this is a town facility, I suggest and, and, and hope that the town will also pass that on to whoever is use in the park, that there'll be a, a representative from whoever's reserved the park, and that representative will be responsible for leaving it the way they found it. Because after some of the events that we have, and this doesn't happen frequently, but we've had to clean up and, and take care of things. Every once in a while, there's something broken. We'd like to know about it, so we know we can prepare, prepare for um, fixing it. And uh, so I think we've got a pretty good track record. Um, we we have had before the before COVID, we had a, a long waiting list of uh, performers, and we went through a process of making sure we provided the opportunity. If we didn't do it one year, we did it the second year or the third year, so that performers had an opportunity. And it's uh, on, on any Thursday night, there could be 400, 450 people there, at the middle, which is incredible. Um, so anyway, our first. Entertainment permit request is being filed here. Uh, it's for nine concerts, but the dates that we got is from June 6th because we we still don't know what our program is going to be. We may be able to fill it in with another one or two, depending upon who who we can get to perform. But uh, basically, a Rotary Club um, wants to reserve Thursday nights, June, July, and August. So that we are flexible enough in order to be able to provide these concerts free to the public. We raise the funds, the public goes to the concerts, we don't charge them anything. We have a 50 50 raffle there. The proceeds from the 50 50 raffle, they could be anywhere from $100, $150, something like that. They don't pay anything here for the cost of the performances, but it helps us to offset the costs of the performances. So that's basically the process. We like to continue it as we go forward, but uh, you know we we are looking forward to celebrating 42 years, uh, 42 concert series since uh, since 1983. Okay, it's been great uh, community service, and we appreciate uh, everything that you've done and uh, proposed to do for one more year. Questions from the board. Uh, yeah, okay. Maybe food for thought for another year. Um, but working with um, like local venues who would typically host concerts, right? Uh, on Zen Barn or higher ground, maybe not higher ground. Um, but organizations of that nature who have like larger booking capacity to see if you could fill concerts on the green with out-of-state bands. We do have out-of-state bands. Again, what we do is we we basically we're fed that information uh, or somebody comes to our attention, they say, hey, you're going to, you're going to see this group perform. Um, in the past, prior, I'm talking about prior to COVID, we had them send a CD. And so we look at the CD and if there's a judgment call, we, we don't want to have uh, Blaring drums and, and 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 guitar music that 
you know, for the whole concert. We don't want to have solid rap for the whole concert, but we look to see what kind of blend of music they have. There. And, you know, over the years, I think we satisfied a lot of people. It's, it's a family gathering. It's not. It's not a, a rock concert. It's not a rap concert. It's, it's hopefully something that everybody will enjoy. We do have a uh, thanks for Lefty. Uh, like to say it, we do have a uh, uh, decibel uh, limit that we try to. I mean, it's kind of difficult sometimes, but we try to make sure that the speakers are faced toward the park and not to the neighbors, and that the decibel limit is kept to. I think it's 85 decibel limits, and uh, and that's you know. I, th I think for the most part, um, we do a pretty good job of that. There are occasions when when the North America gets pretty loud on this atmosphere too. You know, on a nice night, you know, you, I know well going to Randall Street, we've got people say, "Gee, you know, you got a concert going there. We can hear you really loud and clear." You know, um, but anyway, um, yeah, we, I was going to say, don't get me wrong, I love the guys in Maple Run. Yeah. Well, we intended when we, we started this, we intended, and it still is, a cultural arts program. We actually had a puppet show once. We had, we had somebody try to perform. They had a little play that they performed and whatnot. The difficulty we had back in those early days is we really didn't have the venue for it to get the sound projecting out. Mm -hmm. Everybody would have to wear a microphone, for example, if it was a play, and we just didn't have that. Um, so we're wide open to suggestions for other use, and and uh, you know others can use the park on you know Tuesday night, Monday night, whatever. You know, so we don't want any reservation for it. So we kind of encourage the park to be used for that. The bandstand is certainly a uh, an improvement over the gazebo. We we uh, none of us were we were acoustical, acoustical engineers, and when we designed the gazebo with the pitch of the roof and everything, we couldn't envision. At that time, people playing in the gazebo and the sound going up and the sound going down, but it doesn't go this way. <laughs> and it's the performers that let us know that. So then all of a sudden, the performers started to go on the outside of the gazebo on a nice night. And as long as it wasn't raining, they would perform on the outside of the gazebo because their sound could get out to the crowd at that time. And so we've kind of learned over the years, even the bandstand. Um, Jamie, Jamie Lee Thurston was the first big name group that we had there. And his drummer said, I, I, I can't, after the concert, he says, I got a headache. I can't, I can't hear what's going on because the sound vibration in, in the bandstand was so loud. <laughs> so Thurston's own door coverings and whatnot, we went over there and said, give us some rugs and rug samples. And we stuck them on the walls and whatnot. <laughs> The next time they play, they said, you know, it's perfect. <laughs> so we learned, but I think we're down to a system right now where the uh, public enjoys it and we enjoy putting, putting on the performances. I'll move to approve the first ever entertainment permit for the Waterbury Broder <laughs> Club uh, bandstand for the concerts in the park series from June 6th through August 22nd. Who said? Uh, and should we make it retroactive for 42 years? Um, <laughs> I was going to say no comment there. I was going to mention the farmer's market, and then I decided to trust Al and the Rotary. Well, we used to submit the schedule to the village mm -hmm. for the for every far utility district. And I sometimes we get some comments, some, most of the time, it, you know, we just come back, go ahead and do it. You know, we have this something beneficial to the community, and, and, and as long as it is well policed, as far as the building club is concerned. Well, we really never, never had a problem. With it. I would like, I would like our local, local police, the state police, on on those nights to be present just to drive through and circle around. I think it would be in today's day and age helpful just to have some presence of, of um, some law enforcement those nights. Sometimes, uh, even if they want to stop and they enjoy a little bit of the concert, that would be a good suggestion. Uh, okay. And also, I'd like to publicly thank you for uh, helping us with the uh, Waterbury Winterfest this year. Um, I will be by to collect some of the <clears throat> coals from uh, our uh, fire that we had that uh, are still there. Uh, I was waiting for the snow bank to melt away, and I think it has. We don't know what's going to happen this Wednesday and Thursday, but 
barring any other problems, I'll, I'll get those out of your way, and then hopefully the grass will grow back. Uh, you still have the two by fours, by the way. Does you still have the two by fours. Okay. Well, is it Aaron? Yeah, Aaron Flint. I can get a hold of him. Okay. He's he, uh, yeah. Okay. He was out of town, unfortunately, uh, when we were supposed to. Be out. But uh, yeah, but we're doing this. We'll make sure they're not going to get the dust. Been safe. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Uh, I, I, I abstain. I abstain. Okay. I one abstention. I want the to box to move. Yes. yes. But so we I'm do have a quorum. Okay. Of, uh, yes, once. Okay. Next on the agenda. I think on the 22nd, you should have the rolling stones. Uh, <laughs> they may be booked for that weekend. Um, the okay. uh, charter update. Oh. Sure, this one's easy. Uh, the governor signed the charter Friday, just before the end of the quarter, so the uh, the local option tax will be collected July first. <laughs> so I can bring a more formal estimate for the next meeting, but. Um, no, the estimates that were discussed before were in the range of six hundred fifty thousand dollars for the year. Um, that is back ordered a little bit to the in the final quarters of the year. So, think in your mind, maybe three fifty this year. So revenue is it, that, is it beginning in the third quarter? Yeah, beginning July one. July one. So all systems are go. Um, I may, in fact, bring a proposal to you in a couple of weeks um, about a gravel road project that we're working on you and mm -hmm. have, have all the businesses been notified because they're going to all have to change their register. Tax department does that. The tax department, department does that with merges left. Okay. All right. And again, Tom, thank you for staying on that and making sure that it uh, moved through the process with alacrity. Um, the rental property ordinance. We have a draft in front of us. Uh, Tom, would you mind uh, just hitting the highlights? Are we able to see that by any chance? Uh, there's extra copies up front and I can pull it up on the screen. Let me make sure. Can people in, in the Zoom world see that? Yeah. yeah, it's the ones that have highlights on them. Okay. If I pull up the Word document and people in Zoom see it. Yeah, you think about share the screen. So I've got to share the screen. We'll go back to the screen. Give me a second here. We'll get there. Yeah. Share the screen. Yeah. So on this draft agenda, you left uh, property manager notes on uh, most of the sections. Town manager notes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Town manager notes. Um, so those are just by way of explanation. Yes. Um, so I want to start with, um, I did include in your packet, um, Title 24, Section 2291, which is general power is given to town select boards. Um, 29 separate items, but in fact, the very last one um, pertains to your ability to uh, regulate short term rentals. Uh, the other 28 articles don't specifically refer to long term rentals. Um, however, in speaking of council, um, thinks it's well within our jurisdiction to, to include these as one. Um, the other piece, just based on prior conversation with the select board, is that this ordinance in general is about a registry. It is not about regulation. Um, I included in the packet ordinances from other town where they, um, they refer to things like requiring your uh, safety inspection from the state fire marshal prior to receiving your local approval. I did not include that for a number of reasons I can talk about 
um, at length if desired. This is generally about establishing a, res um, a registry. Um, and the language is really focused on that. Um, the definition section, that definition of short-term rental is something that's contained in um, a number of other places, number of other ordinance, but it's the common, I think the common version used throughout, um, throughout the state, which I think should be stuck to. Um, <clears throat> Chester, I noted, does distinguish between um, a hosted short-term rental, meaning an unoccupied short-term rental versus another type of short-term rental. I'm not sure that's needed a definition that can be done in the actual questions as part of a registry. Um, I drafted the definition for long-term rental with the help of counsel. Um, Joe Camarado and Housing Task Force objected to my draft definition. Um, he feels like we need to somehow capture those um, those people that might fall in the middle of a short term and long term. I think he's thinking traveling nurses or people like that. Um, part of the crux of this ordinance is that um, whether it's a long term or short term rental, there have to be a designated responsible person, someone who, in essence, can answer um, for the property, be generally available, and be generally local or at least reachable. That's, that's one of the themes throughout these ordinances is something that Gary Dillon um, feels very strongly about. Um, later in the ordinance, we suggest, I suggest 45 minutes as a callback time. Um, where did that come from? Well, some ordinances say an hour and some say 30 minutes, so I stuck to the middle. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of detailed analysis to get to that 45 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> One other little note, since we have a charter in other other towns, the the, the ordinance, uh, the select board designates who that who that um, at the staff level who administers this ordinance. That's not required anymore since I can designate that. So it makes our makes our lives a little easier. Um, Should we blow the things again? No, we can blow what's when it's finished. Um, on the actual registry piece, um, I simply suggest it's a it's a form that we create that can be adopted later by the select board. The form is not attached to the ordinance because we don't want to have to amend the ordinance every time the registry form itself is changed. Uh, we are working internally and really close to purchasing software that can all be done by the property owners online. Um, not quite there yet, but that's the that was the thought behind January one. We could probably accelerate that a little bit, but I, I can't really say that with certainty because we're not quite there with the software yet. We're really close to signing a contract that might happen by the end of the week, but implementation is a is another matter. Um, one part on the third page that I think um, could be a little controversial and it's probably worth thinking about. Fire chief would like every rental property in town, and in fact, every commercial building in town to have a lockbox, uh, just make it easier for him to get in. Um, it's been a consistent complaint of his uh, since I started at least. They're not free, it's a few hundred dollars um, on the part of the property to get this installed. Um, I don't feel as strongly as him about it. I tend to think if we're getting a designated responsible person, we can perhaps give it a year and and see if see if that person in fact is responsive and see if the fire chief might soften his thinking there a little bit. Um, or at a minimum, I suggest maybe that that requirement can be in the ordinance but not be required January one, but at some future date. It's a cost. It's, um, it's a pain for the property owner, I'm sure. So it's just something worth talking about and thinking about. Um, <laughs> Um, was he thinking of like the lockbox just having one universal kind of lockbox so they could get in, you know, use it for everyone? Because there are a million different kinds of lockboxes. I think ideally, yeah. That's his, yeah. Okay. That's his thought process. Oh, what is the lockbox? That is on the third page under, oh. under rental property requirements. Yeah. 
So that's the one area I think where this ordinance goes beyond a registry into requiring action beyond registration. Um, going on to the fourth page, um, I do just refer a little bit to some of the other towns and the areas where they go beyond the registry. And the two common areas you start to see um, first pertains to the state fire marshal and, and state fire inspections, which are not a requirement um, part of owning a rental property. And in in looking at that with what other towns do, I think it's a bit of an overreach in our part to require the state fire inspection as part of our ordinance. Um, that pertains to state regulation. I think we should let the state do their job. Um, and I think we should leave it at that. Um, second piece is some towns uh, look at look at wastewater permits. Um, and, they, and they look at that and they establish occupancy limits based on the wastewater permit. Um, I think through a registry, we can get data about occupancy. If in fact that person is an EFUD customer, we may do some adjusting there um, to their bill. But in general, if a property owner on a private septic is essentially renting their house at over capacity, I'm not quite sure that's our business to regulate. Uh, maybe something that we develop a different opinion over time after getting data, but it's, it's a state permit. Um, and I also want to add to that, that something council warned me about, and this is something um, I think you see in a lot of towns. If there's a desire to regulate something, but not truly enforce, it shouldn't really be in an ordinance. Um, I think dog ordinances are famous in that a lot of every town has one, but very few towns actually um, really follow it to the, to the degree that it's written. Um, so I think if, if there's not really an intent to um, enforce us at that level, that's what resolutions are for. I, I would even question whether the state fire, fire marshal has the capacity to do this kind of that's another that's another especially great if if more and more towns are going to do that they're just not going to be able to do it it's just like it's just like housing inspections there are not enough housing inspectors. especially yet. since we don't know how many rentals are even in waterbury right so um and then on the fourth page there's a another part to the ordinance that is not about the registry it's a different section of law but I broadly wrote this as a rental property ordinance and that governs security deposits. Something that Kane mentioned to me after I sent the draft was um, common, maybe not common practice, but, but practice is sometimes first month's, land, first month's rent up front, last month's rent up front plus a security deposit. And Kane, I think, suggested some language changes to say that effectively last month is a security, so you don't get three months on day one, you get the first month and a deposit and, and that's the cutoff. Can I think you also mentioned some, potentially some change or that's in defining that. Yeah, this, um, you know, so Burlington and Mary have similar ordinances. And I can speak more on um, anybody's questions about the ordinance of, the section of the ordinance that speaks to security deposits, but in Burlington, Specifically, they include the pet deposit as part of the security deposit. I don't think that's necessary for us. I think if you have a pet, most landlords want a pet deposit. Some pets are destructive. Um, so that language is not reflected in this draft as written. I think it could be. Um, just depends on what we feel it's a uh, fair or necessary to have fun. And then, mind if I just send the and, and then I just on fees, and I want to make sure fees are not fees are fees that would be established as part of a registry. Fees are not enforcement. Enforcement is if you don't comply with the registry. But on fees, um, some towns, not just in Vermont, have looked at the rental market, especially the short-term rental market as a revenue source. By law, we are really supposed to tie our fees to our cost to administer the ordinance. It's hard to really predict what the cost to administer this is, but it is not a very high number in my judgment, um, especially in year one, where we're simply 
where it's simply a registry and we're information gathering. So what's a reasonable fee? I don't, I don't exactly know because I don't know the number of rentals in the town, but I would suggest somewhere between $0 and, and $20 on the high end. Um, it's certainly not hundreds of dollars. Um, not really legally defensible number at that point. Um, and then the enforcement section, which has, uh, in essence, penalties, um, that section was entirely stolen from Stowe's ordinance, which was written with the help of our council, who's the same council for Stowe. So I'm quite comfortable with that language. So that's the, that's the short, slick rundown. The U.S. Municipal Officer would be the one authorized to cover these fees. Um, that is spelled out. It would be a uh, yes. It would be uh, sorry, but I have a typo, but because I stole it from Stowe. <laughs> it would be the fire chief and the town and the town manager. Uh huh. You have a question? If we're starting, sure. Okay. I guess I would say I have a couple buckets of question. One, it feels like there's some specific policy choices we as a select board need to discuss or talk about. Um, I'll start with saying I don't think we need all of these purposes. At least personally, there's some that are more important for, I think, an adequate market supply of short and long-term rentals is an end and an, is an end. It's late in and of itself. I don't dispute it. it supports local employment and business growth, but I guess in my mind, we as the select board can just be supporting rentals in town. And I guess just to highlight, because I know some folks haven't been here, again, the goal is at least the housing task force brought a recommendation to us looking at, we just don't understand what the break term is, long-term, short-term, what folks are doing with their property. So in my mind, that last bullet point about a registry to better understand this is just really key. Um, I even will say I have, not that I don't, dispute residents wanting rights to quiet enjoyment or believing that it's important in other towns. To me, it's just not a driving reason we pursued this policy, mm -hmm. speaking for myself. Um, so I guess my question is how we are planning to go about it. And then I guess my other bucket of questions is around enforcement. Tom, you said January 1, but I do feel like per Candidly, a lot of the content of our meeting tonight, um, we have ordinances and policies and like where the rubber hit, meets the road is is who's doing it. And obviously you can deputize anyone, but um, I just have questions about how we're doing rollout and outreach, recognizing that this is also coming covering long-term rentals. Um, and I will say like some of that fire inspection stuff came up also in housing task force around <laughs> barriers to providing long-term rentals in the community and just making sure we're being thoughtful about how we're doing this in the reach um, when we get there. And on the outreach, I did also speak with, um, Ju I believe Julie Marks is her name, but she's the head of the Vermont Short-Term Rental Association. And I, I don't wanna, I don't know if she's here. So I don't want to exactly quote her, but I, I think in general, our conversation um, centered around that she was not inherently opposed to a registry. The, the regulatory side, which we're at least at this stage avoiding, was, was where the conversation got difficult for her. But I, my understanding from talking with other towns too is that, um, you know, the the Airbnbs, the burglars of the world, have been good about working with their members to get them to comply with registries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ken. Um, to Alyssa's point about, let me see, it's in the purpose page one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, now I can't find it, but you spoke on it, so I know it's here. Oh, uh, Garbage noise, outdoor nighttime activity, and public nuisances. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend that that stay in this first draft and not make it to the second one because people who live in long term rentals and who own houses can also cause these disturbances. Mm -hmm. Come on. Let's <laughs> 
from Bia to Ross Crossman, you said? Uh, sure. I was just going to see if yes. we had any more comments from the board and then open it up to the public. Any others from the board? No? Definitely. Yeah, from board, please. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, it's really good. So, Amy Anderson, uh, 25 North Main Street. I have a multi family dwelling, um, which currently has two Airbnbs in it. So, when I look at all the reasons that you are interested in having this ordinance, I don't see why where any of these aren't already achievable without it, I guess. Um, you know, if you're having, say, let's just take the one Kane just spoke about, adverse impacts on parking, garbage, noise, outdoor things. Like, if there's a problem, you'll get complaints. And so I guess you should already know that if there's a problem with those things. Um, and then if you want to create violent uh, violations of the ordinance, I guess it's some money-making thing. Maybe that's what it's about. I don't know. If it's about better understanding about um, housing, we already know there's a housing problem, and we already know that part of that probably is the short-term rentals. And I think, you know, putting it on black and white, maybe that's useful, but um, only if you're going to take the next step and do the regulatory thing, in my opinion. Um, and so I think a deeper conversation of let's just put it out on the table if that's the issue. Let's talk about why. And part of it, you know, you just heard in the earlier part of the um, other testimony earlier today, landlords have a hard time being protected. And so you have somebody that's six months in a rental, not paying any rent, and having six dogs in there, you know, scratching at the bottom door and damaging stuff. So I just think that this isn't necessarily going to get to the end result if we do what the end result is, which I would hope is increasing housing potentially. Um, so I just was wanting to kind of open the door to that conversation and say, is that the reason? And, you know, maybe this isn't the, the area. And then for the deeper dive, Gary, Dylan, you know, um, I've been on the fire department. He hired me for correction. So, um, Feel bad for saying this. However, um, I do think that it's uh, a slight overreach to have lock boxes. And to say this, I've been inspected by the state fire marshal. Like I take it seriously. Um, we wouldn't need a lock box because the doors aren't unlocked, and you can get to our key. And like, so a phone call would do it. Like I think there's some level of we're going too far. Um, and so I would ask the question again, what's the concern there? Commercial properties where nobody's there? Sure, that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. But where people are living and, and housed, um, I'm not sure everybody needs a lockbox in an apartment any different than a house. Easy access, um, and not to say that I don't trust them because I trust them completely, but I just don't see the need for it or what the, if you have somebody who's continually not being available when you need to get in somewhere, I think then deal with that one person. Um, you know, I guess those are my comments. I don't want to respond directly, but you now I'm going to respond directly. So ignore that comment. Um, but two pieces I would add is one, I would just say like, this is a draft for review. So I will say like, I was asked by planning commission and other members, and this is the first we're seeing this proposal. So just to say that the law piece at least was not a specific ask. Um, to the question about housing, at least I'd say in my two years on the board, we have had feedback about short-term rentals and concern about short-term rental impact on the housing market. And there is more like documentation on this for the housing task force, but when Joe and the group dug into the data and pulled as much data as they could, they still couldn't definitively answer the question. Is it the short-term rentals that are doing it? Is it the long-term rentals? Is it folks buying what was a primary host that's becoming a secondary home that's occupied by no one when that owner is not there? Um, and it kind of hit a dead end. So I guess I would say personally as a policymaker, that is the hard piece. So I, I guess I would hear the end of, correct, this is not a proposed regulatory, but I would say um, folks have asked me and I've said, you know, I don't, I would like to know more and feel like we have some missing data. So I'll say at least the housing task force does have some compilations around data they were able to gather and where there was gaps, just to say that is something we've looked into thus far. Uh, yeah, Al. Yeah, I'd like to just address another layer on 
When we've traveled over in Europe, we've always had to produce a passport. And we had to do that right at the beginning, register whoever was checking us in. We had to have a passport. And that passport was reported locally um, by the person who's renting the property or the, the, whoever's managing the rental of the property. And I think that goes an extra distance for security for the people who are living in the area. Because uh, I live up on Perry Hill, and there are five or two rental properties now around us. And uh, we are more concerned with what's going on in the world about who, who's there, what kind of, you know, not, not that we want to pry or anything, but if there was a problem, all of a sudden we started seeing stuff missing from the house, for example, or, or uh, there was an issue, we saw smoke coming up. Who do we contact? Uh, in the case of where I live, the person who rented across the street from me, a small little place, it's fine, everything's gone fine so far, but he's in England. Always been in England. He's renting through some, somebody's managing the property, or who that is. But it would be a very simple thing, but it'd go a long ways to have the rental property manager, whoever the owner is, whether it's in the home or whether it's a separate dwelling, whoever's managing that to register. But also, when a person comes from Airbnb or Verbo or whatever it is, that they're required to identify themselves so that when they make the reservation, the name's there. But when they come to basically get into the place, they don't just simply go up there and go to a lockbox and take the key and they're there. And, and frequently, uh, I know places we've stayed around before in, in this area and, uh, and over in Maine, um, you know, we just drive up in the driveway and they say the key's there. Nobody checks to see that we're we're the ones who are actually running the place. And and I think for the security and, and comfort of the people who are living around, and also from a law enforcement standpoint, if there was a problem, a very simple thing is to have a positive ID and have the responsibility of whoever's managing that property, whether it's the owner or the or representative of the owner who's on record. Um, that they collect that information right at the beginning. So they have to be there. They have to check the person in. Otherwise, um, you know, who knows who's going to come and go. And, and I think it's wide open for uh, a potential problem. And certainly it makes us nervous more than, than we were 20 years ago when they wanted to go the places. Short term, this is around. I just want to add that I don't know whether this is appropriate time, but that extra layer looking at it from the what are we going to do to keep track of the people that are actually coming in and mm -hmm. using these facilities and putting that burden on the on the rental property itself and some representative of the rental property to keep track of that. And I think the passport or, or driver's license or something can be the way you're doing that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Al. Yeah, you'll notice mentioned, uh, I guess, uh, my thought on this, uh, and I think Alyssa almost, almost alluded to it, is that this is the first time that we're taking a look at it. Um, I think Tom has done a great job of pulling from a number of different towns that have been through this process and uh, trying to select out the things that really address what have been identified uh, as uh, the purposes of this uh, that uh, were identified by the Housing Task Force. <clears throat> but that uh, I'd like to see this be available to the public for public comment for another month and take invite public comment, uh, written and otherwise, uh, before we take it back up uh, to pass the pass the final ordinance. And then even after that, you have time to uh, challenge that uh, for how much, how much time? Another uh, 60 days. Another 60 days. Yeah. Uh, I'm, my name is Sandy Saban. Um, I have a couple of questions, but well, actually one of the statements. One of the statements. Um, Stowe's ordinance is not really working out very well for them right now because they had a special meeting on Friday and it was very heated and so that part of it is not working for them. So we should maybe Do you know which that. part is not working or the whole ordinance they had it, it was a big I was gonna yell room corner. There was a, it, it's not going well. So it's mm -hmm. not it passed, but they're trying to decide whether or not 
they can be passed correctly. Like they're making mm -hmm. more to it. So that may be something to think about. But the second part I wanted to ask Kane, why what is your reasoning behind the one the making it a one month rent maximum? Because right now, this is free from all wide at this point, but there's a few in Waterbury now where one bedroom apartments are going for $1,800 a piece. Mm -hmm. So if you need to pay all three up front, $5,400, that's not a whole lot of liquid cash. That's a, that's a ton of liquid cash that a working person who would be potentially renting a one bedroom apartment would need to have on hand for that. Mm -hmm. Most landlords, throughout the state and a lot of landlords in Waterbury do two, right? They do first with security or they do first and last. Mm -hmm. But the, the extra three in, in a time of housing crisis like this seems unnecessary. And since it's working in places like Burlington and Barry, there's no reason it shouldn't work here. Oh, but is it working? I mean, it sounds like it's working for the tenants. Um, you had an example right here. I was a landlord with two different units in Waterbury for 20 years. We, I don't know how many people we went through that we had to evict. Now uh, we were told by a lawyer, the best thing to do instead of doing first, last, and security is due first, and deposit is two months rent. The reason for that is if you have first and last and security, they, when you go to eviction, they get an extra month because you gave them that first, that first and last. So that gives them another 30 days. If you do the whole thing two months as a deposit, one of the deposit being doubling, if the person's good, which every person that we had since we started doing that was good because they knew they could get that money back. If they were good, you could say, in the last month, just don't worry about it. Just use that that part of it. And we were told that that's the. I mean, we did not have a problem after that, as far as. So I understand it's a lot of money, but six months without any money at all. You think that the landlord can afford it, especially now, any better than? I mean, why should the landlord have to be the one that loses? I mean. I work just as hard as you do. So why is it on me? I mean, yes, I realize it's 1800. I've rented a, a tiny little place for 1800 a month when I first moved back to Waterbury. And it's ridiculous. And I know that. And I'm putting in an 80 now to help out. So I, I understand both sides. But actually, I'm, I'm actually running, renting it out for the Eclipse, so I even know the short time rental flight. So um, it's just not fair to put more on the landlord because the state of Vermont is already on the side of the tenant. I didn't, I couldn't buy my house um, in Waterbury Center for 14 months because they couldn't get the person out. He hadn't paid in 14 months, but the state let him stay. So that's, I don't think that that's fair to put that on the landlord at all. So, this is John. John Gregor from Waterbury and my wife's on the Zoom. Um, for what it's worth, uh, we have um, a long term rental and we did, two, we did the first month and last month. So we are one of the people that you spoke about. So far, we've had good luck. Um, I can see that in your situation. If you had an awful situation, we're going to differ. Um, and so I see what you want to do with that because it is hard for people to come up with three months full rent. Um, the, the part that I'm here to ask questions about specifically or just have concerns about is the Airbnb registry. Um, we bought the building that my wife's business is in from Sylvia, who had owned the building forever. And um, we felt like she entrusted us with her you know, baby. And we bought it because we wanted to make sure that we had control of our own rent for that business. Because it felt like a lot of places were being bought up by people that have means to buy extra homes or many buildings or even out of state and invest and crank up rents. So 
in that building, we have two commercial leases. We have a long-term rental and we have an Airbnb in a small, like one bedroom apartment, which Sylvia had started. We feel like we are able to keep our long-term rentals a little bit lower because we have the Airbnb to help us keep that building. We're staying here in Waterbury. We're restoring and painting and upkeeping a beautiful old building in town. And so please just in your mind, when you think of landlord, think of the local people that are trying to keep the buildings open and keep them ownership local. If you do the registry, fine, have the information. If it's let's tax Airbnbs, or they're the problem and start raising those costs. Some people are going to sell their building because they just can't keep up with the cost and the taxes and the school going up. And I get it, my kids in the school system and we want them to have a great school. So just the <laughs> landlord can be the local person trying to keep a building. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. I just want to respond to John. I know myself personally, I. I understand the, Air, the Airbnb process pretty intimately. And I don't think, and I don't, I'm not going to speak for my the fellow people, folks on the select board, but I think folks look at Airbnbs who are owner operated, someone who's in the community, you know, they have an extra part of their property that they want to have for some rent. Property, I don't think that's the problem. I think it's the out of state investment that's buying up a lot of property. But that's what the problem is, is, is that's where I think that's why I think I'm very much in favor of the registration process because we have to have a handle on what's there before we can do anything. I don't know if we want to jump right into regulating, but I think from everyone I've spoken to, I know a lot of people in the so community. Short-term rentals are exploding there, and it's really taking up properties, you know, for, for, for people, you know, that could otherwise possibly buy them. I know so is not that much of an affordable community. Waterbury is not that far behind. But I think to prevent a property owner from converting part of their property to an Airbnb type function for some extra income so they could stay here, I don't have a big problem with that, you know, but I think I think the community probably is going to have more of a problem. We have these big out of state landlords coming in, buying up a lot of properties, and we're going to have less and less units available for rent and for purchase by Waterbury and other area residents. And I think that's what the actual short term problem is. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Bill Shepard, Waterbury. Um, I think the registry is a good idea, uh, just to kind of get a handle on how many Airbnbs are out there and whether or not it's contributing to the uh, lack of housing availability for people who live here. I would encourage you not to do a lot of regulation. Um, Tom, you talked about the wastewater permit. I don't know. I understand that you don't want to necessarily um, speak to a lot of things that you might not want to enforce, but I, I think it would be helpful if, even if there was some mention on whatever registry form that you have, that, you know, if you have a, a single family, three or four bedroom home, um, that putting 20 people in there for every weekend all summer long might not be a good thing for your septic system. Uh, I have an Airbnb that's right next door to me. The people are from our state and it's rented a lot. And that's my major concern about it is that it's, and we have a, their leach field is on my property. There's an easement. Uh, it's a separate leach field, fortunately, but I do get a little concerned about that. So. If there's a way to address those kind of issues, just to put the uh, light bulb out there, I would suggest that would be a nice thing. Um, I too was a little curious as to the uh, 
to the um, provision about the uh, short-term uh, security deposits. And I'm not a landlord and I haven't rented for a long, long time. I understand completely what you said, Kane, if you know there's a fifteen or an eighteen hundred dollar rent and it turns into forty five hundred or fifty four hundred dollars up front, it's difficult. Um, what my concern would be is that um, if landlords are asking for this, in my experience of people is that they don't typically do it just to take money out of people's pockets. You know, it says here that all of the deposit can be held against normal wear and tear uh, or against non-payment. But if you if you take the first month and and a security deposit, and then um, there's damage to the property, and then at the end of the lease, the people don't pay their last month. Well, then you don't have your last month, and you don't have your damage covered. So. It's a little bit of a concern. So I think people who are property owners have a calculus as to what they decide they're going to require for a deposit. And to me, I would let the market regulate that. I know it's tough for the for the uh, renters. My my kids are you know in their thirties, and and uh, my son in particular has a tough time, and I get it. My concern would be that if a landlord uh, is deciding that they need first, last, and a security deposit, and then the town tells them that you can't do that, that maybe the landlord just says, you know what, I'm just gonna make it an Airbnb and I don't have to worry about this. And you take another unit out of circulation. So I think you just need to realize that if you make a regulation, people react to the regulation and it may be um, counterproductive to what you're trying to do. It, might, it may just take places off of uh, being long-term rentals. And the last comment I would make is on the enforcement. And I know, Tom, you just copied this right from Stowe. And uh, I know you said earlier about fees and it's not intended to be a moneymaker. And in fact, fines are not supposed to be intended to be money makers that tend to make people comply with the ordinance. I would say, however, that if you have an ordinance that has a waiver fee and you have first through fourth and subsequent offenses and the civil penalties are also first through subsequent offenses, fourth subsequent offenses, maybe you should have a waiver fee for sorting first and second offenses if they keep violating the ordinance and you're you're issuing a fourth subsequent offense and they can get away with a waiver fee of four hundred dollars, maybe you ought to be taking them to court and and charging them with a civil violation. They seem to be maybe losing the system a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Bill, one question. Yeah. Uh, as a health officer, do you have any jurisdiction? If, uh, let's say, a rental property uh, is uh, got a failing septic system? Not as much as we used to. The state has primacy with regard to um, on-site septic uh, enforcement now. Um, if, there is a, if there is a violation of a, of a, of, of a leach field, the health officer might be involved in the health aspect of that, right. suggesting that there could be a public health issue, and then you know, when you come to the select board and and have to maybe engage an attorney. Uh, but in terms of permitting and um, all the rest of it, the state takes care of all of that stuff, I believe, Tom, right? Yeah. So, so it, it could, you know, from a just from a public health standpoint, the health officer could get involved, but with regard to actually uh, regulating and um, kind of overseeing the standards necessary and whether the leach field meets state requirements, that would be the state folks would be doing it. And the other, the other challenge is we can certainly in a registry ask a question about. You know, your essentially your max capacity 
Um, we could, in theory, compare that to your approved septic, but not all of the, first of all, that's an awful lot of work because you've got to go permit by permit. Right. And not all permits are on the lot. Some of the older ones are not. So mm -hmm. um, it's just not something that realistically I think we could get done without a whole yeah. lot of time and energy. Yeah, I don't think, I think you're right, Tom. And I, my point was just to, if you just have more of it, you know, just be careful not to put people you put into a, into a single family. Yeah, home. I think that's a good idea. And the last thing I wanted to say, and it's more to the to the point that was being talked about with regard to um, the uh, you know out of state uh, owners of properties that are short term rentals, especially those that are corporate owners, and that's really an issue the state needs to come to grips with. They've got to be able to find a way to somehow tax them differently than just a, a, a standard, you know, non-residential homestead, a non-residential tax for education purposes. Because some of these communities, and I think, uh, you know, the town manager in Stowe told me that, you know, they're, they're down to like 30% of their single family housing stock is actually still residents and the rest is people from out of state and in some places, uh, uh, I won't name the town because I'm not certain of it, but some of the other ski areas is one that has, you know, a, a local uh, ownership and occupancy rate of less than 10%. And if the, the state's going to have to address that with uh, education taxes because it's not it's not fair um, to, to do that. But that's not really your So we have this so, lovely... Um, um, Vermont property tax return analysis. And when I said Joe will dig up any data, Joe will dig up. Yeah. He got the 2019 to present property taxes in Waterbury. And just, I can share this. I was trying to find the other housing task force slide. And I will say it was actually um, a lower amount than anticipated about residences being purchased by out of state LLCs or transferring from rental. But just to say, like, we are trying to get a handle on yeah. i'm not disputing that that's water this is waterbury and i can do he did total transfer to a non-vermont buyer all sellers all property types then we had the transfer of how many is a primary residence going to a non-vermont buyer how many is a secondary residence going this is all based on what folks have to fill out when they transfer but i will say like this is exactly the stuff i feel like we are trying to dig into right. that answers because to be honest some of these were really surprising when we went through them at the last meeting in that you know yes there certainly is turnover i'm not disputing it but we didn't see these and immediately say oh my goodness you know we've had yeah. dozens and dozens and dozens over the past five years um, right. but as property values continue to go up you're going to get a higher percentage of I think I would say oh, oh yeah, no, I'm not just being yeah. that. I guess I'm just saying again, you know, my part my cards are on the table, but my bottom line is I think driving to a registry so that we can start trying to track some of these dynamics with more things. I think I'm hearing that there's complications in some of the other pieces. So, you know, I will say I'm not opposed to the septic thing. I don't want to give anyone a disincentive to register in terms of like even the eBud comment you made made me nervous around like I rent in a long-term rental and I'm just thinking about like the outreach it will take to have every property in Waterbury that rent short or long term registered to me is just no small lift, but I also think it's really important to do so that we can start having more nuanced conversations. But right now we're doing the best we can with the data we have, but we're all talking in anecdotes and generalities because it's all we have. Yeah. Um, thank you. And I've gotten to the point of being okay with the registry at this point because I do I did wonder if that was the goal. Like I'm really appreciative of that feedback. Um, but two things. So first, lots of and security. I want to make a comment too. I, I appreciate that you guys have brought the, the things up that you have. Um, as if I did have a long term rental for a lot of years, we required first class security. Um, but then uh, we're flexible with somebody who said I just have first last or whatever it was. And then I said, okay, we'll take an extra hundred a month and we'll put it in there. So we get our security, they can afford to get in there. But without the choice, which Burlington and Barry loses, you've got a huge, huge, huge housing problem in both of those areas. If you look at the data, 
people don't want to rent when they have no protections. And then when you talk about the septic, I'm very appreciative of that. We just heard seven people and six dogs in a one bedroom mm -hmm. apartment. Then you're going to find a landlord for that. I mean, just think about the ramifications. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, thank you. I yeah, can't okay. turn my video on. Mm -hmm. This is Mark. I can't figure out how to raise my hand. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Mark Fryer, uh, Waterbury Center. Um, I, I appreciate that the work the select board's doing. I, you know, I sat on the board for a number of years, and I think one of the challenges that the select board and the town has as we get into this affordability problem that has been growing year over year is that you got to have the data. And I think the board, um, if they haven't done it yet, should make sure that they all agree on maybe a goal vacancy rate that they're going to work towards with the planning commission and I, and vacancy rates, the huge, a huge indicator of supply demand and, and price. So I think, you know, when we talk about affordability, when supply goes down because Airbnbs take over long-term and, and single family houses and those turn into Airbnbs and that supply goes away, but the demand, or just renting or buying continues and those units aren't replaced, then I think you find yourself in the situation we found ourselves in. So I think unless those units are replaced, which grows grand list and helps with affordability, then you're gonna continue down a road of if the market bears that we're gonna continue to be a popular tourist destination and other reasons why people might even have second homes here, then we have to replace those units. Um, the other option I think without totally flipping the market is, you know, I own a, a property down in Austin, Texas. And since I, when I bought it, they had a moratorium on Airbnbs. Um, and I don't know if it was based on growth before they would reallow more, but it's a consideration that I think once you found, if you state that you're gonna wanna try to get to a long-term rental vacancy rate percentage, and you have all the data that you need because this registry exists or other ways that you can get the information, you could work towards goals. And then when you hit those goals, you could, you know, I don't think there's ever probably going to be a point where the board screams for more Airbnbs, but I think the board should be screaming for more long-term rentals and single family homes. So how do you get there? I think this is a start. I think it's got some work, obviously, as the discussion has shown, but overall, I think it's important to have the data and use that data to your advantage to, to hopefully make Waterbury a more affordable place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Yeah, Chris. So I've heard, I'm just gonna uh, <laughs> make a few comments here tonight. I've got a two bedroom apartment, it's been vacant for six months. And uh, the last tenants were in there were friends of mine. They, uh, I didn't charge them a security deposit. Uh, or last months because I trusted them because they ran in from me once before, a long time ago, and uh, they were great people and they left the place just as they just as they entered it. Um, but now I'm thinking of about an alternative for that unit. Um, not sure what it's going to be yet, but uh, maybe Mickey, if you wouldn't mind speaking to it, he's got a few apartment rentals, what the cost of uh, repairs are today when it comes to, you know, restricting first month rent, last month's and security deposit. Um, I think we all know that the cost of building period is astronomical. So uh, I gotta believe that uh, that extra money is there that the landlord takes uh, would be eaten up pretty quick. Uh, when it comes to repairs. Um, to Mark's point, um, the moratorium that they had in Texas to try to offset the uh, problem with long-term rentals, um, that's a state issue that needs to go to the state because we've heard here a couple times tonight that uh, the disparity or the, or the lopsided scale when it comes to uh, tenants versus landlords, it's in the tenant's favor. That needs to change. Uh, that's probably part of the reason that I'm not interested in, in going out and, and rent my two bedroom uh, long term because I just worry about getting a bad tenant in there uh, and having to deal with that where short term you can still have problems with that, but it seems like a, a more secure bet in the long run. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Th
Yeah. Yeah, my name is Adrian. My name is Mikhail Petrovich. I do have two nano buildings while we um, have been there since 2012. So I have a pretty solid brand history or, or experience and how pretty much economics of how everything works. So, um, and I've had many tens of different demographics in the past 12 years. I had tens that would leave this place up so it was spotless. I had tenants where where they take me. I had once that I had to leave somebody and it took like six months to make them and five thousand dollars in water fees. It took me like a year and a half to recover to re recoup all their money. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like from everything that I heard, it would be really beneficial for for members of the board to have somebody on the board who actually really understands what is involved in. And how much risk and how much work is involved in, in being a landlord? Mm -hmm. Full time. Landlord. A lot of many times I thought about switching to the Airbnb and having that whole thing because A is way more lucrative than than a full time rental. Uh, and absolutely minimal risk in my opinion. Because tenants are coming a couple of three days, there's not really much they can, you know, ruin or or, or break in a couple of three days versus somebody who is who is in your apartment for a year, two, three, or five. Um, most of the time, even if the tenants leave the place, on the best note, that security deposit that we talked about is nowhere, nowhere needed to cover just the flipping cost for the next tenant. So if everything, nothing gets damaged, if we're literally just walking out, everything's perfect, by the time you paint the place, do some kind of touch-ups, and then there's usually a month, place a month time we lose that rental income until the next tenant comes in, it costs you twice as much than than uh the debt deposit we're talking about. So the moment we take somebody in, all that risk is on us. And as a long-term uh, landlords or we don't really have an incentive from from the town or or a state. There's, there's literally nothing that says okay well we're gonna incentivize you to then a full time, if is the goal of short or or cutting down on short term rentals. So I think that would be beneficial is to have somebody who can really like break down and see 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 what's involved. And also, I just want to say we have two landlords. I don't think either are full time on the housing task force, and okay. we specifically look for that. And I will say this was not a recommendation from them. The housing task force just recommended straight registry, short term and long term. Just, so just to uh, kind of comment on uh, on the uh, limiting um, how much, and, and I fully agree. I fully agree. I I, I have uh, rental units that I believe they went from uh, eleven hundred dollars a month twelve years ago to two thousand dollars a month, but everything is going up. Property taxes. There you go. Thirty percent property tax increase is coming. That cost needs to be passed to somebody. Like somebody has to pay for. It. Uh, unfortunately, is that tenant because you, you can't really come out of landlords. Like, it unfortunately cannot. So, so the, the 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 margins are really slim. The risk is huge, um, and and you're literally you're on call twenty four seven. There's no there's no downtime though. So, um, yeah, that's why I'm there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah. No. Hi, Matt Fulkerson, Waterbury resident, long-term renter. Uh, I have been renting in Waterbury for five years uh, as of May. Um, I got extremely lucky, my partner and I, um, you know, not a lot of open rental apartments uh, in Waterbury even five years ago. It would be much harder now if we are trying to find an apartment here again. Um, I think maybe just a perspective from a, somebody who's been renting here for quite a while. Um, you know, one thing that I think is very difficult for people who are renting is we would love to buy, you know, as many people would love to. Um, but ultimately, there's a set number of houses that are here. Building, as we all know, is takes a lot with Act 250 and other regulations. Um, and I think the, the hard thing is um, housing is not optional, right? Like housing is not a commodity like an iPhone. There's market demands on housing that 
if you are the owner of that housing and you're renting it out and you're letting market conditions decide the rent, the worst case scenario is that perhaps you are losing passive income, you are losing an investment property. If you are the tenant in that situation and you are you know, priced out of your apartment, you are potentially on the streets. And you're on the streets in a state that has you know, uh, inhospitable outdoor conditions most of the year uh, and does not have adequate social services. Uh, we saw, you know, with the armory, with a lot of the conversations around the hotels. So, you know, I am, I'm very sympathetic to people who have these uh, homes that have been in their families that they'd like to keep, you know, maybe they're renting it out. Um, maybe it's a full-time job, but, you know, for a lot of people, we haven't had our first yet. Well, there are many people who have seconds or thirds already. Uh, and so, you know, the registry, I think, is the very first step to understand, you know, an accurate picture of renting short-term, long-term uh, in Waterbury. But, you know, longer term, there are these really huge barriers to long-term, you know, purchasing home ownership for a lot of people in my generation. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm 29, almost 30. Uh, and the prospects for me of buying a house in Waterbury are, you know, pretty bleak right now. Um, and so it's probably going to be renting for the foreseeable future. If there were more homes available, if people put their apartments up for sale, like that would be, I think, huge to a lot of people in Waterbury. Uh, so I'm, I'm sympathetic to, um, you know, the, the plight of, you know, landlords getting back tenants and things like that. But ultimately, you know, the need for, housing, stable, good housing, I think has to take precedent over short-term passive profits. Uh, and, you know, you have private equity, you have head funds buying up so many single family homes. It just creates an untenable situation for so many young people in the state. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the reason why people are leaving. Uh, it's the reason why a lot of people can't afford to stay. Um, you know, I know someone who, got priced out of their rental in Waterbury and now has to take the Amtrak into work. Like that's the Amtrak. So it's not a good situation. Um, and it's um, it's unfortunate. So I'm, I'm really excited about this prospect. Um, I think the security deposit, um, reducing that barrier to entry for rentals is really huge, especially if, you know, we want to allow people to get off of the street. You know what I mean? Like if you're not in permanent housing, you're not going to be able to cough up several thousand dollars to be able to get into long-term housing. Um, so reducing these barriers to entry, prioritizing affordability, all these things are great, but you know we can't really begin to do anything until we even know how many rentals there are in town. So very supportive of the first step. Um, big shout out to the good landlord. So I hope they know I respect them. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and, uh, okay, and, um, and I'd just like to say we're I'm recognizing that we're almost an hour over time. Uh, sure. and, All right, well, then I will. I just want to I'll pull the comment back. Recognize, and, and also, uh, my intention is to leave this open. We're not going to be voting on this tonight. <laughs> yeah. Should I have one more? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. One. Um, that was a second. <laughs> Um, I've just been thinking about this. I'm just throwing it out, kind of creative thinking. The last comment, um, you know, seemed to be at odds with what I said and what Mr. Petridge said about um, the uh, security deposits. So if that's a real issue, and again, this is just a food for thought. I, if I was sitting where Tom is, I would think about this and then bring it back to you, but I'm not sitting there anymore, so I'm just <laughs> going to throw it in his lap and you guys can <laughs> kick it around. <clears throat> but it, this almost sounds more like this is a, a public policy issue, a concern that if there are people in the community, I don't know if there are rental units available that somebody has to, you know, um, wonder whether they can come up with for some period. Uh, if there's no units, it doesn't matter. But if there are units out there and people want to rent them and they can't, <clears throat> I don't know if you have any ARPA funds left. 
I know you've got all kinds of different reserve accounts, but maybe the account could be the bank as opposed to the landlords for the first, last, and security deposits. The landlords, I think, have a lot of risk that they're taking. They've got a lot of expenses. And I think most of them own their properties, hoping someday to sell their properties they bought for 300000 for 600000 But during the time that they own it, they're hoping to kind of break even. They're not, most of them aren't, aren't uh, landlords that are making their living off of being landlords. They all have other jobs like John and, and Mickey do. So, you know, if the town could set aside $50,000 and say, we'll be the security deposit bank or the down payment bank, if you want to buy a house, come to the town, uh, you know, the bank wants you to have whatever, 10% down payment, and it's a $300,000 house, and you got to come up with $30,000 or $15,000, whatever, whatever it is that you got to come up with. And they can only come up with 10, or if they've got two months security deposit that they can pay and they need three, maybe they can borrow that money from the town and pay the town back monthly over a certain period of time that would replenish the bank. Uh, it's not, what, even if you don't have ARPA money, even if you don't have reserve money, if this is an issue that's so important to the town to try to get young people to be able to buy in this community, put it on the ballot, put it before voters at town meeting and say, do we want to invest in our town? If, you know, one, you know, five sevenths or five eighths of a cent on the tax rate would give you $50,000. And it, it, you'd have to manage it. There'd be some people that wouldn't pay you back. How you uh, put a lien on them to, to get that back, I don't know. But if this is that important, maybe it should be the town that takes the risk as opposed to forcing the landlords to take the risk. Now I'm jumping about I've actually had a couple conversations just over the couple of years with different board members. What you suggest about down payments. Um, so if you think Stowe is unaffordable, go to Aspen. You won't find anyone working in Aspen that's a resident of Aspen. That's just the way the way it is. So ski towns out west are ahead of us. I shouldn't say ahead of us, behind us in that respect. Well, I'm going to Aspen put a moratorium on all Airbnb. So there are models where there's there's down payment assistance for individuals that work in a community and in some cases it's not even to live in the community to buy in that community it's just to maintain your work and you can live nearby because the because the community itself is unaffordable the challenge with all those things is you know administratively there's a mortgage um you know you've got to, you've got to track it when people buy and sell um if you're talking down payment assistance, if you're going to give someone 10%, what's the average sale price now? 600, something like that. So you've got to be awfully well capitalized on day one. Um, I've seen programs like this where the, the way they treat it is it's a mortgage on the property. The owner sells it. When the owner sells the property, if the, if the buyer qualifies for the same program, that equity stays with the property. The buyer doesn't, then the municipality has to get made whole for the sale. Um, so it's it's not free, it's not easy, but the real challenge is capitalizing up front. If you're, you know, fifty thousand dollars, if it's down payment assistance, is is one or two properties. Um, so if you want to do it, you know, millions is what you need to start with to, to do more than a few. Um, that's available already. The land trust have it, the housing finance um, authority has it, you know, so it's, it, there's a number of sources yeah. that have that down payment. It, it's the question more for, for the renters. Yes, I think that's that, dollars the renters can, I mean, that could be a fair number of units. The renters don't have right. that. Right. And it's just, it's just the thing, I'm not saying you have to do it, but, and, and you might be right, Tom, um, that for, or down payment assistance. I mean, I think in any of this assistance, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to be fully funding the down payment or the or the security deposit, but you know, maybe they come up with half the money. But 
Well, we were talking more about renters, and that was my main focus, was that if you're going to limit landlords in terms of how much down payment or security deposits that they can get up front, and we've heard why that is sometimes difficult for landlords to do, maybe there's an opportunity for the town to be the bridge. So, mm -hmm. good suggestion. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to cut off the date on this. I appreciate everyone taking the time and providing your input. Um, I think we'll be taking this back up uh, the first session in May. Um, and I encourage you again to submit your comments uh, through the town clerk uh, so that we can be better informed. Uh, we'll take a vote on the final ordinance. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, all. Thank you, all. Thank you everyone. Appreciate it. All right. Next item on the agenda is uh, a proposed buyout at 34 Union Street. Buyout and, and elevation. Yeah, and elevation. The owner of 34 Union, let me get his name right for the record, is That's Ben Gernan. How do you spell that last name? G E R N A N D. G E or N-E-N-D. N-A-N-D. Ben? Yep. Nick Perkinan had the unfortunate experience of buying just before Irene. Oops. Um, I spoke to him today about an elevation project, and he mentioned that he started down that road some years back. So I'm, I'm hoping we have enough of a file from the past that uh, the, the first step in, in doing an elevation product if you've got to invest your own money um, and get an elevation certificate you've got to have an architect engineer to essentially develop plans you that raises the structure above the floodplain um, that may have been done some years back so we're, we're going through the files to try to find that if it wasn't he'd have to take that first step um, he's interested in that conversation um, he's also i also talk to them about a buyout. And in essence, what I said is um, there's no harm, there's no foul in pursuing a buyout. It's a long time to get to the actual number that FEMA would offer, and you can say no. So in essence, it's a risk-free, no obligation quote to sell your house without a real estate fee on top of it. Um, interestingly enough, he was expressed that he had been interested in the buyout when he bought the house, but at the time the town was uninterested in, in offering buyouts. Um, so part of the conversation was that, you know, he wished this was on the table after Irene, but it is, I think it just in general wasn't, I'm not sure. But in general, he's he's interested in, in pursuing both options at this point. I don't have the paperwork with me for the elevation or something to sign or simply an express interest by the select board that I can convey a FEMA for the buyout. There is paperwork which I can bring if you're all interested in going forward, letting you pursue both options. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone like to speak to this issue and or make a motion? Um, are, um, are you asking for a motion today on this? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll move to approve um, the option or suit you want. I move to either support an elevation study or approve the buyout for 34 Union Street. Second that. Okay, discussion? Well, they had, did they hit the deadline? Was, was a block list for priority? <laughs> well, I guess we don't have the paperwork. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's an ongoing process. So, yeah. a bit where it is, time goes on, if additional people express interest in the, the state share. Yeah. Well, that's why I say I, um, I think I would make the motion regardless. Um, but I, yeah, the poll, I mean, it's union. They've been really badly flooded. I think yeah. if someone wants the option, we should support it. So. Just for information, how many buyouts are we up to? <laughs> so it says to be four, right? One on Main Street. All right. Um, and this would be the this would be the fourth this would be the third on union. Third, yeah, third third on union. yeah, I was saying there were two already there. Mm -hmm. We don't want a main street, so okay. 
Okay. okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that's approved. All right, next is uh, next meeting agenda. We have a copy of the draft agenda for uh, April 13th. Yeah, I have one suggestion. Mm -hmm. I know this has been in the pipeline a long time. I know there was an annual hearing today, but you might want to consider not having two draft ordinances being worked on at the same time. You might want to get through the rental property ordinance before we undertake the animal one. Mm -hmm. Just to think it can be delayed. Yeah, strike the uh, animal control ordinance. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm fine with that if we sub rental. I feel like the to me that we need to work on ordinances. I mean, or or parking is going to be a healthy discussion too, but. Um, I guess we can revisit this rental you had just said the next meeting, Roger, but in terms of like, I think we heard testimony from folks tonight. I think there's decisions around like this firebox, around security deposit, around what we proposed. And I guess I would say I'm interested in having a conversation about what implementation looks like um, as part of our concern. Okay. Well, in Todd was indicating that part of the implementation of the registry was uh, the software uh, for which we don't have a lot of information. Yeah, we can have more. Yeah, so we can wait. So you're saying you may both may six? Well, uh, I guess, yeah, I was thinking that we we give ourselves a month to get more input on the uh, on the rental thing and then try to address that uh, the first meeting in May. Um, I don't know that, uh, I guess I'm, I'm wondering whether the animal control ordinance, uh, is going to be particularly controversial, um, and whether we wouldn't, whether we'd be in a position to approve, uh, a, uh, an ordinance, uh, at next, on animal control at the next meeting. What do you think? Some of it was just like minor updates that Tom yeah. um, yeah. and or Karen proposed. So I'm yeah. Not, um, yeah, generally I don't believe controversial, though I, I do get a fair amount of <coughs> feedback about animal issues. Um, yeah. So I will just say we have the bylaw hearing. I asked if I walked in is warned for May 6th. I don't know if it's confusing to have the mental ordinance and the first hearing of the planning commission yeah, we're zoning sorry. regulations at the same year. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fine and it may be inevitable, but I'm just naming per the bulletin board bylaw hearing was May 6th. All right. Um, and we move the rental one to two weeks from now. Or two weeks from, oh, never mind. This is the next meeting. This is the next meeting. Yeah. Do yeah. you want to switch animal control with? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And we can still discuss from the lobby discussion without it being. Sure. Yeah. Got pretty heated there. Just an FYI, um, next meeting, I might not be here in person if I'm going to be moving my mother in law to a nursing home. Mm -hmm. So I could probably be via Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Um, pretty sure that Ian will be back. Uh, also, he's just a uh, family issue that he had tonight. Um, okay, anything else uh, on here that uh, 
think is uh, we're gonna have a fair bit of time devoted to trying to fill vacancies. I would also propose as a practice that we don't solicit public comment on that, which is a bill shop left quote, but on vacancies. On board appointments. I guess sure. I don't know. I I don't want to have a substantive conversation, but I think it I think it can put folks in a weird position to be asked be asked questions by a member of the public here. I think like we as mm -hmm. the select board are appointing folks and I sometimes feel bizarre about endorsements or tacit and non-endorsements from audience members mm -hmm. or wonder if that's a reasonable expectation of someone. Oh, I only have a J question. Uh, and to be yeah, clear, I'm not, li I'm not <laughs> limiting to tonight's conversation. I'm thinking oh. like a year ago planning commission appointments when we had, what is your view on the future growth and development of water right from an audience member? Oh. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, it's just, uh, <laughs> since it's on the agenda, you know, and yeah. Bill Shuffle has been at the, like he has said before, like it's a board. I don't know. I, I in general like that we solicit. It is one particular one. I think it can be bizarre. And it's a it's a board appointment, or in this case, a board recommendation. But at the same time, um, if they're appointed to the school board, those very questions will be asked to them for quite a long time. Yeah, no, and I'm not saying it's, I, to be clear, I mean, it's a point of discussion. Like, if folks overrule me, I'm not going to say I'm just, it's a dynamic I've noticed that is sometimes odd. Well, I appreciate the fact that you ask people to uh, address me. I do think that that helps uh, avoid that dynamic where people are being attacked more personally. Uh, if, uh, if someone is bringing an issue that they feel needs to be considered, uh, I feel what like I found it kind of a little odd getting the email endorsed from a public member. Uh, endorsing some of the candidates. I think it's fine they can get them. Just to me, that's very different. That, right. I can offer little... my opinion on anything, educated right. or not. It doesn't mean I'm uh -huh. presenting it. Anyway. Uh, um, I'm not sure it's going to be ready for the 15th. We're finalizing the work in it with um, CVRPC, but the um, hazard mitigation plan. We should put a placeholder in for the 15th, I think. Um, I don't think it'll be ready. I think we'll have to modify. I think Roger and I, before it's finalized, can take it off. But um, something we have to get done. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Mike, you asked about handicap parking in the business district. And I'm noting that we also have parking ordinance. Tom, is that a you, a Neil, a someone? So there is the good old fashioned, I bring this up because it's before the bylaw hearing, there was the parking ordinance that was the village's that is now ours, that involves cars stacked 17 high outside the reservoir to meet parking minimum requirements. Um, and I'm just wondering if, I guess we're not going to have a draft proposal. Just to, to me, it's germane to the handicapped parking in the business district. And so have, have it it so I've been asked for a couple of people who are handicapped, they said, you know, it's really unfortunate that, you know, granted there are some that are a little, but some people have pretty limited mobility and there should be at least one space dedicated in the business. Situation. Yeah, I had a brief conversation with Bill Woodruff about this. Um, Probably had something to do with the big data. We're going to, you know, obviously there's standards. Right. That we're in compliance with. We were going to go through and see if, um, see if we could identify a couple other spots to potentially make handicapped that made sense and bring something back to the board with it's that i understand that especially after my my need stuff when i had limited mobility we can we can have that not that i had even a handicap of space but i could see some people who have to live with that maybe be something that really be germane to them all right um, any other comments? If not, we'll take those and uh, try to get the, everything uh, worked into the agenda for the 15th. Thank okay. you. All right. And next is uh, the. Why is the Peter traffic in, in, in the car? I have everything that says the stuff. Uh, Leaf Peter parking uh, was a question about. 
whether uh, we needed there, there was yeah, uh, like, by any of the events. No, it was it was not about the leaf keeper right. event. It was about leaf people weekend, and uh, I think because of a change of ownership at uh, Cold Hollow, there was not a public uh, police officer. Right. Okay. Uh, I got directing it. traffic as a result, the uh, traffic going the wrong through right. the center. I think it had to do with like the half mess. marathon and all that. But yeah, no, it was just the usual uh, last problem. weekend in September, first weekend in October, traffic mess on Route 100. And I didn't. Uh, I don't feel like we need to have that absolutely nailed down until probably sometime into the summer. Um, does anyone, anyone care to make a motion about entering a deliberative slash executive session? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they're separate okay. items, so you need okay. to... Okay, do I have a con... Is it a contract? So the executive session um, I'm requesting is about the employment or employment or evaluation of public officer employee. So oh, you technically that. you would technically need to make a finding that premature public oh, knowledge. Yeah, I got that. Uh, I move to find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage in regard to contract negotiation. Second. Move and second it all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Write all that down. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> you said contracts. Um, oh, what did I mean? It was um, I have a I have appointment um, an employee issue appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. Ah, oh, so close. We'll try again. Okay, do we need that one? Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll unpass that one. I moved it on past the motion just passed. And you could do a friendly amendment to the well, actually, no, we'll just, it's, it's, it's late. We'll, 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 I move to enter executive session for the purpose of evaluation of a public employee. Thank you. Second. Second. Moving second at all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 